This is Bazaar Morning Call. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. We are coming to you live this Tuesday morning as always from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios. I'm Prashant. With me, my colleague Sonia and Nigel. Guys, hi, good morning. Hi, good morning, Prashant. Good morning, morning. Nigel. And you get a good feeling today, right? I mean, there are, uh, I mean, you might get a good feeling every day for other reasons, but there are so many positive cues this morning that the street can latch on to. So it looks like it's uh, not going to be such a bad one. I think it's a good morning. You know, the overnight <coughs> queue was good. Weather is lovely here in Mumbai, unlike what we normally see, a little cooler. Yeah. Getting out of bed is a bit of an issue, but. It looks like a better trading session, so let's hope there's a bit of a bounce back. But the haze, man, I mean, it's the like, haze is know, a bit it's of just, the pollution uh, is that's true, actually. But anyway, I mean, you, get, but once you you're snuggling, you can't be. <laughs> <laughs> Till you are. It's hard to get out of bed, yeah. Especially when it's so dark in the morning, yes. right? And you're just like, okay, now I have to do this. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, hope that things for the market are not uh, hazy. They're a little more clear. They are. They are clearer as compared to when we came into trade yesterday morning, because yesterday morning, global markets. I mean, the backdrop was that the S and P was down about one and a half percent last week, while the market here had held on. That's not the case this morning. So, you know, a positive for global queues after last week's 1.5% S&P 500 drop. Uh, and uh, the, when I say positive, what do I mean? NASDAQ was up about 2%, 2% plus actually. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the S&P was down about 1.5% as well. <clears throat> the trigger seems to be, and we put this quote up uh, to, uh, you know, what uh, Fed, uh, Dallas Fed President Logan said over the weekend in his speech, you know, he raised the possibility of the fact that perhaps there is another rate hike, but the market chose to latch on to another <clears throat> portion in the same speech which he gave on Saturday in which he said uh, that, uh, you know, f the Fed's balance sheet tapering, basically <coughs> the uh, quantitative tightening, uh, that the pace of it, which is about $60 billion right now, that could be, uh, you basically will slow and eventually sometime down the line, the Fed will once again be a net buyer of bonds, right? which is QE, and that is what the market chose to latch on to. But that's just one official, uh, but that, uh, you know, it, it, the markets uh, uh, chose to uh, pay attention to that rather than what uh, he, he said about in rate, uh, interest rates. Now, in terms of data, one-year inflation expectations, New York Fed uh, one-year inflation expectations have also fallen to about 3% compared to 3.36%. This is especially important because on Thursday, we get this uh, consumer price uh, inflation numbers, CPI numbers in the U.S., which, uh, I mean, I think uh, at least in these five this week is the single largest data point which market will uh, latch on to. Oil prices are sharply down. There's no real news flow. I mean, over the weekend, there were uh, reports of, you know, Saudi Arabia cutting the, <coughs> the contracted crude prices for Asia. But I mean, so maybe sentiment, but that's it. Brent was down 3%. We're at about $76 a barrel uh, at this point in time. Now, just to circle back to what, what, uh, where we are at yet, as of yesterday and where things may head from here. We closed yesterday on the Nifty below, uh, just around the 21,500 level. The final adjusted close was 21,513, which is basically the low last week. Now, the 20-day moving average, which we put out yesterday morning also, remains the important support. That number is, uh, <clears throat> the 20-day uh, the moving average is uh, 21,425, which is about 75, actually it's about 100 points away from where we left off yesterday. Only a decisive break of the 20-day moving average can uh, sort of, you know, <clears throat> lead to further meaningful downsides. I mean, if that were to happen in the coming days, uh, the downside target, to my mind, would be somewhere around the 20,900 uh, kind of levels. On the way up, and this is the negation of that uh, <clears throat> downside, on the way up, keep a watch at yesterday's high, which is 21,764. <clears throat> because if the, if the index trades above tw that level and then stays above it, closes above it, then you're basically looking at the fact that this was just a one-day kind of a pullback and the market charges right back up. So I think today we are in a bit of a wait-and-watch kind of zone uh, because the GIF Nifty, I think, is also indicating a higher start. We'll get to that in just a bit. At the Bank Nifty, uh, <clears throat> you know, we closed decisively below the 20-day moving average. <clears throat> On the way down, uh, the Bank Nifty, which has been the weaker of the indices, uh, can test the 40-day exponential moving average, which is 46,659. It's more like a target if the index stays weak and the bounce today is sold into, etc. And again, the negation will come if the bank nifty, uh, you know, sort of crosses the high that we saw, which is 48,382 in bank nifty's case and stays above it. So <clears throat> more than anything else, I mean, 
you know, watch for these levels, the 20 day uh, and, and where the where Nifty especially trades, do we get closer to it? And of course, on the upside, if the market is able to take out the recent highs, then I think, uh, as I said, you want to trade long, you want to buy the dips. But for today, I would say, uh, you know, maybe a bit of a wait and watch. The gift Nifty is indicating 100 points higher kind of a start. Uh, so don't jump in straight at the word go because there's not very much by way of trade there in terms of risk reward. Uh, but, uh, you know, you know, see what markets do and mm. hand, hand over to you in terms of the close which will give you a better, clearer picture when we come back tomorrow. Sonia. Oh, absolutely. And there's no doubt about that, that today the start will be strong. But what happens in the second half of the trading session is, uh, you know, what the market will keenly watch out for, right? Uh, we have a lot of positive cues today. The US markets had a really strong run. It was the best day for the NASDAQ in the last two months. It was a big rally that we saw for the tech stocks in the second half of the trading session. Uh, the Dow was up 216 odd points. Uh, today, you have plenty of sectors that will be in focus as well. I'm looking at the auto stocks very keenly because a lot of positive updates coming in over there. Strong Q3 wholesale sales from Tata Motors. Bajaj Auto had that massive buyback. But remember, Bajaj Auto also rallied in anticipation of that. So maybe a lot of the news is in. Uh, but these are strong sentiment indicators for the sector. Both FIs and DIs bought in the cash markets yesterday. Crude prices have fallen as uh, you know Prashant was also pointing out. Now, yesterday, the Nifty defended the 21,500 mark and the bank Nifty defended the 20 DMA, DEMA on, on close, right? So, it's important to see what happens in the second half of the trading session. If the Nifty crosses yesterday's high, then the uptrend perhaps can resume. But if it doesn't, then maybe you could see a sell-off in the second half. So, yes, the start will be in the green, but do we build on to that? Time will tell. Another thing I'm watching out for is the India's possible inclusion in the bond index. So, after JP Morgan... India could be included in the Bloomberg bond index as well. And that could be in a phased manner over the five-month period. So, a lot of the street is watching out for this. Um, in September of 2024, the inclusion could start with about 20%. And there could be, the economists are expecting that there could be an inflow of around 2 to $3 billion over a five-month period. Remember, earlier JP Morgan had also included India in its bond index. And if this happens, if and when this happens, there could be a lot of buying interest from FIIs, from DIs, from retail. So this is something that the street is watching out for very closely as well. A lot of positive triggers for the bulls to latch onto would be a very interesting day of trade. Well, that's right. You know, Sonia, two big triggers actually overnight. Normally, we've been getting up to a little bit tepid uh, overnight yeah. queues. This time, it's good. NASDAQ was up 2%. Yeah. So that could have a positive rub off on the Nifty IT index. And also, Brent crude prices, as you all mentioned, was down closer around 3% overnight. So both those two are the positive global queues that are coming in there. For our market, so yes, you know two ways about it. The Nifty and the Nifty Bank, the close was extremely weak. When you have the last tick at the low point of the day, that's a bit of an issue. But what's not an issue is there was no big institutional selling. So the bulls will feel good and they'll take some solace from that fact that yes, there was some selling, but maybe the weak hands getting knocked out uh, as well. The 20 DMA, it's very, very crucial, both for the Nifty and the Nifty Bank, but for different reasons. For the Nifty, it becomes crucial on the downside. For the Nifty Bank, it becomes a bit of a resistance on the upside. You get more confident once it gets above that level, the 20 DMA on the upside. What took place yesterday? The Nifty Nifty Bank ended lower, but the shorting took place on the Nifty Bank. And we had open interest built up by more than 20%. It appears the FIs were shorting the Nifty Bank a little bit, just trying to collaborate the data. Big surge in open interest. The FI positions as well should come up for you in the screen. They added close to 18,000 short contracts. That's the highest short contract addition in a single session in close to around two and a half months. The last time we saw such a big open interest build up in terms of, uh, you know, the FI on the short side was on November 2nd. And just take a look at that. The long positioning has come down drastically. We didn't want that number to go to around 100,000 odd. Well, that's come down to around 59,000. You feel a lot better when the markets are not overly net long, when the FIs don't go overboard on either side. So now we have some shots in the system, which is not such a bad thing as well, because the short positioning has gone to around 38%. Well, just pull up the options data as well. Yesterday, I had a weak trading session and called right in return. So 21,600, 21,700 call. Both of them, between them, they added closer around a crore share as well. So there was aggressive writing being seen on the call side. While on the put side, you had some unwinding of positions. And that's what brought down the PCR from around the 1.1 mark to around 0.8 forward. We normally see it bottom out at around 0.65 to around 0.7. So we have some distance to go from there as well. Another cue that we'll be tracking today will be the Nifty Financial Services Index. That plays out its weekly expiry. So that one will be in focus as well. It ended at the low point of the day yesterday. There's been a fair bit of writing at the 21,500 call for the Nifty Financial Services Index. So the start is in the green. 
you want to track the Nifty Bank, whether it can get to that 20 DMA and if it can build on from there, and then you take it from there. But for the time being, I think we're still in that range of around 21,500 on the downside, 21,850 on the upside. Results will give us further direction, but good to see a green start. All right, good to see a green start and trade and a big one at that, 125 points in the green. So let's see, uh, you know, how that takes shape and form. But lots of opinion coming through in the next two and a half hours, so don't go anywhere. First up, Amit Sachdeva of HSBC says that FII flows into Indian equities rebound strongly amidst positive macro context, ending 2023 with $21 billion of inflows. He says strong FII flows are likely to persist on a benign base benefiting large caps which lagged in 2023 and offering better risk-reward ratio. He also says financials are favourably placed and the risk-on stance could trigger a rotation into laggards such as IT in 2024. <coughs> Sunil Turmalai of UBS says, outperforming by 11% in 2023, India trades at an 86% premium to emerging markets. He says, FII's and household flows into the market held strong in 2023, supporting these valuations. Uh, he believes the optimism is driven by a perception of better geopolitical and macroeconomic positioning. However, sell side uh, EPS growth estimates and their lowest ever uh, are their lowest ever, and valuations are close to their peaks. He is underweight India within emerging markets. He says UBS likes infra, industrials, and utilities. They're underweight uh, <coughs> autos, consumer discretionary, and cement the neutral bank staples energy and IT services. All right, let's also get you some money market cues now for the morning. Abhishek Goenka of IFA Global says 2024 has started off on a good note with uh, the FPI pouring in $6.5 billion in equities and $3.2 billion in debt in the first few sessions. He says markets have pared back expectations of rate cuts by the Fed to some extent and US yields have stabilized. He also says the dollar has made a bit of a comeback. However, Abhishek says despite the recovery in the dollar, the rupee has outperformed and he expects the rupee to trade in a range of 82.70 to 83.50 over the medium term with a slight appreciation bias. Well, on bonds, Vishal Goenka of IndiaBonds.com says last evening Bloomberg announced a proposal to include Indian government bonds in global emerging market local currency bond index. He says this news, along with slight easing of liquidity in the banking system, should see bonds rally three to five basis points today, with a 10 year benchmark bond deal likely to be between 7.13 to 7.18%. He says overall direction of the market <coughs> will be <coughs> determined by important upcoming <coughs> inflation data with, UV, uh, with U, uh, US and India CPI scheduled for later this week. Well, we've got a lot of stock to track for you. we get to that in just a bit in our special top 10 segment. For the time being, we just run you through the list. We'll look at Bajaj Auto, Tata Motors, Bandhan Bank, Fino Payments Bank, IRB Infra, all of them will be reacting to positive news flow. Add to the list, GMDC, Metropolis, as well as Oro Pharma. All of them reacting to positive news flow. While on the flip side, you have Capacite Infra, as well as ONGC, could be reacting to negative news flow. Okay, well, uh, <coughs> that's basically the uh, picture, which is uh, uh, the, the stocks which we will uh, focus on in just a bit from now. Let's uh, <coughs> complete the loop on what uh, you know the global environment holds uh, for us. Rana Gupta is senior portfolio manager, India equity specialist at Manu Life Investment Management. Rana, great to have you with us here. Good morning, Prashant. This side, uh, seasons greetings to you. Happy New Year. <coughs> you know, just want to start with that bond index inclusion news. Uh, in some ways. It's uh, inevitable. JP Morgan announced it finally in September of last year. And now Bloomberg is saying that they will do the same. Uh, it, it's, it's got, you know, very positive implications over a long period of time. Uh, first, of course, is cost of capital and a structural basis <coughs> reduces here. What, what's your sense, just kind of sort of your first thoughts on what this means for the market here? Good morning, Prashant, and a very happy new year to you and uh, all your co-anchors and all your viewers. You are right. This Bloomberg bond index inclusion was expected after the Chip Morgan thing happened. And uh, we will we could see inflows which could support the currency, which would potentially even uh, bring down the cost of the capital. But I think, you know, we, the investors do not just buy because it's part of the index. I mean, of course, passive funds do, but... For the big money to come in, the investors need to take a view on the inflation. Now, I think one of the most, uh, I think, credible things that has happened, and we have spoken about the, the fiscal consolidation, the current account deficit correction, you know, for some time. But I think the structural decline in inflation towards this, you know, more like 4 to 5% range 
is also uh, also a very good thing because if you go back in the past like 5 7 10 5 7 10 years indian inflation easily was 7 10% from there to decline to a 4 to 5% due to in fiscal consolidation due to supply side improvement due to current account deficit reduction and inflation staying in that range overall sets a very good background i think for the uh, for the bond investors uh, to put to, to put in money okay all right uh, so that's uh, the jp morgan inclusion uh, in uh, including india in the bond index earlier and now the possibility of india being included in the bloomberg bond index that is the big trigger um i also wanted your thoughts on how to approach equities now because uh, you know a lot of things are working in our favor fis have come back in a big way crude has fallen quite a bit uh you know you've seen this domestic fraternity the mutual fund community pick up in a huge way the cult is growing so do you think that uh, 2024 could see some more build up in the equity markets here in india and what is your pecking order looking like now so i think uh, if you look at uh, the valuation uh, part of it the valuation i think uh, for india is now a bit on the higher side because you know right now i think indian market is trading at about Uh, 18 times uh, if at 26 that's uh, that that's you know uh, towards the higher side but i think the liquidity portion is strong uh, what we would say is that uh, we would see is, says that that you know in the last year if you look at the last calendar year almost any sector if you go the sector right for example real estate all the stocks went up if you got capital goods sector right all the stocks went up most of the stocks stocks went up this time round i think one has to be more bottom up and uh, should not bet on you know a sector pulling through all the stocks so this time round one has to be much more bottom up than than last year all right hi rana good morning and good to see you on the show i recall the last time we spoke you know you were hinting that maybe in the near term china could see a bit of a rebound that's not really happened right in terms of either the stock markets or even the economic data so i think india is appearing like the market that will stand out Do you believe that the flows continue to India? Or do you see we could see in the near term some deviation to China? See, I think last time what uh, what uh, what what we mentioned is that you know China, as long as they do not address the export and real estate, which has been supporting this economy for a long time, as long as they do not kind of address that, this market I think will remain range bound. Uh, also, I think uh, another option could be China addresses the consumption in a very big way. Uh, which uh, through through real estate also partly, which we have not seen. All the measures that have been taken has been more like incremental. So therefore, I think we have not seen much move from the markets. I think it is a prerequisite for Chinese markets to do well to address either the export or the consumption or the real estate issue, which so far we haven't seen. And obviously, I think uh, because China not doing well, uh, the other markets, including India, because of all the things that is happening in India, has been a big beneficiary. but i think i'll just you know have to highlight if you take look take a look at the emerging market like china i think india was up something like a 20% last year but i would also highlight that taiwan south korea uh, did quite well so did the latin countries right so they are also doing well uh, in fact some some countries in asean lag uh, last year so you know they could see they could even see a rebound so i think that you know china underperforming and while coming to india uh, uh, will continue to happen but you know uh, given india's performance uh, we could see some in you know, the competition from other markets uh, and that it could that could be asian or even latin or not necessarily china all right uh, rana we we'll leave it at that thank you for joining in and uh, you know giving us all those updates about the market let's dip into a quick break there are so many stocks that will be impacted today lots of news flow coming in so don't go anywhere we'll be back in just a minute
So there are plenty of stocks in focus this morning and we kick it off with Bajaj Auto which could start off in the green on the back of the massive buyback that they announced yesterday. They told us about it last week as well but yesterday the pricing, the size was out and uh, the buyback will be up to 4,000 crore rupees at 10,000 rupees a share via the tender route. It's a big premium to the current market price. It's at a 43% premium to the last closing price and this buyback will be 1.4% uh, of the equity shares of the company via the tender route. If you assume even a 30% profitability for the company this year, the overall dividend plus buyback that the company will give is to the tune of 8,400 crores. This is well above the 6,500 crores they did last time around. Just to give you the details, last time in July of 2022, they purchased shares worth 2,500 crores and in FY22, the dividend plus buyback was 6,500 crores. But we were expecting this, although the quantum of such a big buyback was not expected, but remember the cash on books has gone up to almost 20,000 crores for the company. They said that over and above 15,000 crores, whatever cash they make, 70% of that will be returned to shareholders. So they're staying true to their promise and giving back to shareholders. Promoters of the company will also be participating in this buyback. Currently, the promoters hold 55% stake. The only thing is that the stock has rallied in anticipation of the buyback. So, you know, maybe some amount of the juice is out. Uh, but we will be having the management of Bajaj Auto to talk about the buyback in a short while from now as well. Okay, all right. So we'll uh, stay tuned for that. But Sonia, it's a busy morning. Tata Motors as well. Uh, they uh, declared numbers. How are they? Oh, it was a really good set of numbers coming in from Tata Motors. No complaints at all. And perhaps that's the reason why the stock has been doing very well too. The wholesales in Q3 were very strong from JLR. Uh, this is the highest wholesales that we've seen in the last 11 quarters. Up 27% year on year, up 4% quarter on quarter, coming in at little over 1 lakh units. The retail sales were up about 29% as well. They were higher in all regions year on year. UK was up 55%, overseas up 49%, China up 28% and Europe up 27%. The company says that the order book continues to reflect strong demand for JLR products. They have 148,000 client orders at the end of the third quarter. This has reduced from 168,000 because of the increased order fulfillment to clients. So now they have higher production and they can fulfill a lot of their orders. And the demand for Range Rover, Sport and Defender remains particularly strong. The only disappointment is this time around they haven't mentioned anything about the free cash flow which they generally do in their uh, Q3, in their you know quarterly updates. But this time, nothing of that was mentioned. But be that as it may, good set of numbers coming in. So I'm going with green. All right, uh, Sonia. <coughs> Thanks uh, for that. Uh, so autos in focus there with both Bajaj and uh, Tata Motors. Let's focus on financials now. Bandhan Bank was the big volume-led lo loser yesterday. Abhishek is standing by with what's happening there. And uh, he'll touch upon what's uh, the news at Fino Payments Bank as well. Abhishek, morning. Morning, Prashant. So, uh, Bandhan Bank sources tell CNBC TV18 that there will be no forensic audit uh, by RBI. Now, detailed audit will be taken by CGFMU, uh, which is the Credit Guarantee Fund of Micro Units. So, audit by CGFMU pertains to claim of about uh, 1,200 to 1,300 crore that is being done by uh, Bandhan Bank, uh, which they had also highlighted in their con call last time around. Uh, so, audit is required as the claim value is above 1,000 crore. If you have it below 1,000 crore uh, there is no audit required by CG FMU however the amount right now is about 1200 to 1300 crore and that is why you will have an audit over there this is bank's second claim uh, under CG FMU earlier claim funds have been received by them so detailed audit do follow as I mentioned uh, you know uh, since the amount is above a thousand crore there will be a detailed audit after the sample audit remember that the bank uh, has to receive 2600 crore in totality with respect to the uh, you know the flood issue Assam exposure that they have of which 2200 crore will be from CG FMU alone Bandhan Bank has not yet responded to CNBC TV 18's uh, query uh, Fino Payment Bank RBI has received application for on time licensing of uh, small finance bank uh, by Fino so SFB status will help Fino Payment Bank uh, start their banking operation on liability as well as asset side of the balance sheet their market reach will become wider and they'll have more funding sources as well. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Abhishek. So we'll keep an eye out on both those two stocks. Vivek joins us, though, to tell us about some more stocks in the news. Vivek? Well, good morning. You know, quite a few stocks on the radar. The first one is Capacit Infra. The company has gone ahead and launched a QIP. Now, as per, uh, you know, the term sheet, what we understand is that the company is looking to raise up to 200 crore rupees. The base size is uh, 150 crore. The remainder is an upsize option. Now, the indicative issue price is almost a 9% discount to yesterday's closing price at 251.6 rupees a share. Now, the indicative uh, 
base size dilution is close to 7.8%. If the company chooses to exercise the upside option, more than 10% of equity dilution will be seen. Uh, what is the company raising funds for? You know, number one is for funding working capital requirements. Uh, that is close to 150 crore of the issue. The remainder of 50 crore is for general corporate purposes. IRB Infra is the other stock on the radar. The company has gone ahead and reported the December toll collection data coming in quite strong. So December toll collections at 488 crore on a consolidated basis, up almost 26% on a year-on-year -year basis. The Invit toll collection too is up 16% on a year-on-year -year basis. And lastly, GM you know, watch out for this particular stock in trade. A strong news flow coming in over there. The company Surka Ligmite Mine is the one that is in focus. It has received the environmental nod to go ahead and do a capacity expansion. The capacity expansion approval has come in to increase the capacity from 3 million tons per annum to 5 million tons per annum. All right, thanks a lot for that. Well, there are a couple of more updates coming in. There's Metropolis, there's Aurobindo Pharma. Sonal is tracking that for us. Sonal, morning. Good morning, Sonia. Let me start with Metropolis, where the company says that they, did, they saw an early double-digit growth in revenues from their core business. And their core business grew by 12% on a YY basis. Majority of it was led by volumes. So they said the volume growth this time around it was 9%. Their B2C revenues grew by 14% on a YY basis. Their gross debt, uh, uh, absolutely uh, closer to the nil mark, around 13 crore rupees. Uh, however, they say that margins are slightly lower on a YY basis, so we'll try that closely. Premium wellness and specialized segments are the fastest growing segment in quarter three of FY24 for Metropolis. Uh, so expect that stock to be in the green. Aurobindo Pharma is in focus because their Telangana unit has received establishment inspection uh, report from the US FDA and they have uh, classified this particular unit as voluntary action indicated, which means that there's no further regulatory action which is required for this particular unit. So there's some relief coming in for Aurobindo as well. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for that, Sonal. Well, Manisha as well joins us to tell us about crude, which slipped overnight. Manisha, morning. Morning, and thank you for that, Willie. As we saw, the crude oil prices fall by nearly 4 to 5% for both these varieties. And with this decline, the crude oil prices now are trading at around six-month lows. A couple of factors that are weighing onto the markets. One is that with the weakness in demand, especially coming in from China and the rest of Asia, the Saudi Arabia has now cut official price to Asia by 2 to $1.5, which is the lowest in 27 months. Also, there is rise in output from OPEC, which was supposed to actually see a cut. So for the month of December, they have increased output output by 70,000 barrels per day. We also have the U.S. output at around record high, so the inventories have been on the higher side, and demand, whether it's from Asia, U.S., or Europe, shows slightly on the weaker side, and that has weight on the prices. The markets will now watch out for the EIA short-term outlook report that comes in today. The strength in U.S. dollar index also has been putting pressure, and then the street will also watch out for the OPEC meeting that now has been announced for 1st of Feb for further direction in terms of outlook. All right, thanks a lot, Manisha, for that. In case you missed out on any of the stocks, here they are. Stocks with positive news flow today, Bajaj Auto, Tata Motors, Bandhan Bank, Fino Payments Bank, IRB Infra, GMDC, Metropolis Healthcare and Aurobindo Pharma. While stocks with negative news flow, Capacity Infra and ONGC. Let's take a quick break. On the other side of the break, a lot of these stocks will, discuss, will be discussed with our guest, Hemang Jani, for some fundamental stock analysis. We'll also connect with Abhay Bejal of Chambal Fertilizers. The board has approved a buyback offer of up to 700 crores. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Basad Morning Call. Well, let's get straight to discussing a couple of stocks then. We listed all of them out for you. But to help us with some more analysis, we're joined by Hemang Chani, who joins us on the show. Hi, Hemang. Morning. Thanks so much for joining in. Well, let's talk about the top stock of the day. It'll have to be Bajaj Auto. You know, we've already seen a good run-up post the announcement that they will consider a buyback. They've uh, announced the buyback now. As a percentage of the total equity, it'll be less than 2%. But the price is quite attractive at around this uh, 10,000 rupee mark. And also it provides an opportunity for retail because the acceptance ratio will be higher out there. How would you approach the stock at current reckoning? Good morning, uh, Nigel. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, definitely uh, Bajaj Auto uh, buyback announcement is quite aggressive, particularly on the pricing term, given the fact that the price is currently about 7,000 in the buyback. 
price is about 10,000, which means it's about 40% premium to the current market price. The size is uh, reasonably okay, about 1.75% of the equity. What, what is important to understand is that it's not going to be an open market, but it's going to be a tender buyback. And uh, the retail uh, you know, basis, the current uh, shareholding, uh, which is there in the company, the uh, acceptance ratio would be anywhere in the range of about 35 to 60%. So surely, I think uh, it's a good opportunity for investors to tender in the buyback and uh, you know buy the stock from the open market if they wish to hold on to it, given the overall outlook on the two-wheeler space and particularly for Bajaj. Okay, so you're saying that it's a good time, a good opportunity for investors who have these shares to tender in the buyback. Uh, because the growth is also looking pretty good over here. All right, got that. The other stock to discuss is Tata Motors, right? Very strong wholesales this time around. But, um, I mean, they haven't mentioned anything about the free cash flow. Generally, they do that in their updates. This time, maybe, you know, they've already given details on what the free cash flow will look like, etc. But do you see some incremental gains on the stock? Because the numbers are looking pretty good for the quarter. Yeah, so, yeah. so uh, the wholesale number, uh, you know, shows about 27% kind of growth. Uh, and, uh, you know, generally, it's been a little volatile in the past. But now with the uh, very strong, robust growth uh, coming through and the fact that on the EV part, company has chalked out a very aggressive plan and we all can see how even in the Indian market, they have pulled out very interesting products. So I think uh, overall, uh, we have positive view on Tata Motors and we think that it still can give about 22-23% kind of an upside from current levels as well. Okay, all right. Uh, so, you know, I also wanted, since we're talking about autos, let's just complete this entire, uh, you know, loop, right? I wanted your thoughts on some of these companies that also have a big exposure in the defense space, for example. But first, let's listen in to the interesting uh, discussion we had with Bharat Forge's uh, Chairman and Managing Director, Baba Kalyani. He turned 75 yesterday on, and mm. on this milestone occasion, Shireen spoke to the man himself on the way forward for the defense business and the overall uh, growth for the Bharat Forge group as well, listen in. What I want to understand from you is the pace of acceleration that you've seen. And I know you said previously that the last 10 years have perhaps been the busiest that you've seen in your career. Uh, you know, it took you 45 years to get to 10,000 crores, 20,000 crores next year or... Uh, year you know, after next. <laughs> year after next. On track to, to get to that? Yes, very much. Okay, well, uh, Hemanga, I mean, you know, there, there are big milestones that they talk about, but also the stock is at a fresh 52-week high, and this entire defense piece is really working well, right? Uh, not just Bharat Forge, but the BEMLs of the world, HAL, etc. Uh, do you like any of these names even now, despite the rally? I think, Sonia, surely it has turned out to be an amazing theme, and, and look at the way the stocks have really gone up, right? Uh, the fact of the matter is that... Uh, before the election year, you will see uh, some aggressive announcements uh, by the government. But what we have to be very mindful is of the fact that is there any material change in the overall growth that these companies are delivering versus what they were doing earlier? What 12, 13 percent versus that? Will it really uh, be very significantly higher? I, I, I'm here to see that number come through while the order info announcements excites everybody. Uh, you know, it is yet to reflect the actual numbers. So I am a little uh, cautious at this point of time. However, some of the companies like Hindustan Aeronautics and Bharat Electronics can be the beneficiary of the increased uh, you know, order inflows and industrialization that the government is announcing, but uh, would not be comfortable aggressively chasing uh, you know, uh, defense names across. Uh, <clears throat> Himang, uh, you know, one of the big disappointments in the microfinance space has been the largest player there, which is Bandhan Bank. Uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, it's actually not very far away from uh, COVID lows. You know, <clears throat> so significant underperformance. And yesterday, of course, there was a sharp sell-off once again. Abhishek has been reporting on this. What would you do with this one if you own it or is there something actionable here from, from now? <laughs> yes, uh, uh, overall, view was positive. The, the Q3 update was uh, decent, both in terms of uh, deposit growth, which was 15%, advances growth about 18.5%. So not much of an issue in terms of the business update. But 
in between for some of these banks to keep, you know, hearing about, uh, you know, some issues and, uh, you know, uh, some sort of audit being undertaken by RBI, forensic audit and stuff like that. So I think, uh, you know, in the current scenario where things are looking up for the banking sector, particularly more so for the smaller banks, I think uh, Bandhan presents a great opportunity uh, given that we've not had any major disappointments or asset quality issues as such and the valuation comfort is pretty much uh, there. So we look to buy into any such uh, small corrections that may come through for, for, for such reasons. Okay, Heman, uh, just stay on. I wanted your thoughts on some of the other spaces as well, like fertilizers, for example, right? Chumbal Fertilizers has been in the news. The board has approved a buyback of up to 700 crores at 450 rupees a share via the tender offer route. The company's promoters and the promoter group has expressed an intention to tender their shares under the buyback offer. To discuss more on this, we have Abhay Bejal, who is the managing director of Chumbal Fertilizers. Mr. Bejal, uh, good morning. Uh, will the promoters be participating in this buyback and what is the cash on your books currently? See, the promoters will be participating in the buyback that is uh, on pari passu basis. And uh, in terms of the cash in our books, we have something like, uh, which is projected as of uh, end of uh, March, is about 1500 crores. Got that. Uh, Mr. Bajal, good morning. Uh, could you tell us <clears throat> how has demand been uh, in the third quarter and has rubby sowing improved significantly in January? So, fortunately, we are in an area that is very well irrigated and uh, we have so far faced no demand issues in so far as uh, any of the fertilizer products that we are, uh, we are dealing with. Uh, and so far, also in the agri, uh, you know, the CPC, what we call crop protection and specialty nutrient space, most of our sales have gone through smoothly. And uh, there was a slight delay in sowing, uh, which has caught up right now, I think, towards the end of uh, December, that uh, deficiency was made. So uh, I think we are pretty good on uh, uh, meeting our targets in terms of sales. All right. Hi, Mr. Baijal. You know, I wanted to understand uh, how the channel inventory is currently. What we understand is that it continues to be high for both fertilizer as well as crop protection products. So how are we seeing it currently and how will it impact your volume growth for the Rabi season? See, the Rabi season is more or less over. It ends by 15th of January for us. So as far as we are concerned, mostly it's done and dusted. Most of our volumes that we wanted to bring in and sell uh, has been done. Uh, we are now actually preparing for the next season. That is the situation. So there's also been a revision in gas costs recently. How did gas costs pan out in Q3 versus Q2? And generally, what are raw material prices looking like? Are you seeing any pressure on margins because of that? the real issue for fertilizer industry is availability on time uh, because it's a very seasonal industry. As far as my knowledge goes, two, two or three major items are phosphoric acid or phos rocks and so on, and so far as uh, and gas. Our gas supplies have not been interrupted. We have seen no reports either from Gale or AOC saying that there is an issue on LNG supplies. We have also understand that they are taking alternative routes from Cape of Good Hope. So there is some delay. And also there is a, a increase in freight cost and insurance cost, uh, war risk premium and so on. Now that is impacting uh, how it will go forward and impact the prices. I do not know. At the moment, my understanding is that most of the producers are taking the hit by lower net pack. <clears throat> right. Uh, Mr. Bajal, will there be a bigger impact of uh, the disruptions we are seeing in the Red Sea route, trade route? No, I do not know the situation, how long it will last. Supposing it is over by 31st of January or so, it would not be a lasting impact. But as far as if it continues and goes up to March or April or flares up, for instance, then there could be a long-term impact which is spread into a go into the Kharif season. As I've told you, 
people at the moment either they are producing or they are importing for stocks the sales impact will be known only by kharif but if the normal price of purchase has gone up or there is not as much material available then there are there are uh, disruption issues which could uh, happen so that is what is more important that the uh, supply chain is maintained all right uh, are there any outstanding subsidies from the government i would say that we have been very comfortable because the government was well provisioned in terms of the money and uh, my understanding is that at the moment uh, what is due uh, is the normal amount of about 2 uh, 2 two, two months or so outstanding which is the normal course because the material goes it goes into the point of sale machine then it gets sold and you would realize that when i told you that this is the end of the rabi season application of fertilizers would normally not happen we are accumulating stock into the system at the moment so it will start getting liquidated from april on but at the moment whatever is due in terms of whatever bills that we have to raise we are very comfortable on that and if you were to treat that as data as the first point of sale we are there in terms of two and a half to three months two and a half months which is normal for this period of year because we are end end of uh, rabi well we appreciate you uh, detailing your business sir but from an uh, you know india perspective the next big event that we're looking forward to is the union budget what are your expectations so i just say i have said three things out there first of all the fertilizer industry is faced with a peculiar gst issue what happens is that the output is a lower base for tax because there is a subsidy element there and by law you cannot apply gst on subsidy you can only apply gst on mrp this is more so in the case of the phosphatic and potassium fertilizers not so much in urea so what happens is that you keep accumulating gst into your system and unless you have a business combination which you can use to take that out it will ultimately result in a loss of gst because you are the auditor at some point of time will say that your past 3 years or 4 years doesn't seem to be recoverable and you are continuously accumulating so you will have to take a hit in your books although technically you can carry on the credit for indefinite period the second thing we want the government to look at looking to the period that there's a election coming up and there will be kind of stasis in terms of futuristic uh, demand they should make a adequate provision for subsidy for the year 24 25 and number two they should make adequate provision for the first quarter itself so that in terms of the cash flow the companies do not get stuck up and uh, i say that the third demand that has been a long standing demand of the industry is that uh, they should press the button on dbt 2.0 whereby the government pays more or less to the farmer directly and uh, changes the mode of payment not through the company but via the directly to the farmer that will introduce a whole new dynamic into it all right uh, <clears throat> mr vajal uh, thank you very much for joining us and uh, appreciate you taking out the time and speaking with us here on cbc tv 18 well as uh, fertilizer as a sector but let's turn the focus back and attention back on the markets anuj is here standing by with a look at how uh, he's seeing the markets on his morning morning prashant well the markets uh, at very crucial levels yesterday's close in particular while the market was weak it still managed to defend some crucial levels the nifty defended 21500 and the bank nifty defended the 20 day exponential moving average the texture though has changed a bit to sell on rally and in that case today will be the test of the market's texture if the rally is sold into or not if it's not and if you start to cross yesterday's high that will be a signal of the market's correction ending but if you start to sell into the rally and break yesterday's low that will be uh, an ominous sign uh, Uh, in terms of basic cues uh, well uh, there's big rally in the us led by nasdaq so my sense is with the nasdaq reclaiming 10 and 20 day exponential moving average today it could be your star pocket i won't be surprised to see a 400 to 600 point rally in the nifty it which would mean that we will also reclaim 
the 10 and 20 day exponential moving average. On the Nifty, the levels to watch, uh, the first resistance is 21,670, options based, and the bigger resistance is 21,764, yesterday's high. This is the zone in which I expect the first selling uh, to come into. But in terms of support, uh, 21,492, yesterday's low, and 21,413 based on options would be the big supports. Uh, on the bank nifty where you added a lot of short positions yesterday, we need to see how the fin nifty moves because it's the weekly expiry of fin nifty. But the bank nifty traded in an 800 point band yesterday. So it's too tough to give exact levels, but you want to watch out for the first hour high and low uh, to see how the trade is shaping up. There's no real clarity on which way things could head. Things could still go either way, right? <coughs> they could and if you can't take two-sided trade in January, then perhaps it's not the month for you. January is known for volatility. Uh, we made this point in the Sado series as well. You had a trending uh, December. January could be slightly different. All right. Thanks a lot for that, Anuj. Have a good day. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be joined by Mitesh and Sudarshan for a technical check of the market. Stay tuned. Okay, welcome back. Uh, you know, we're about nine minutes away from the pre-open session and uh, Gift Nifty is indicating a sharply higher start. But will it last is the question. And can we do anything with a 120-point higher start? Mitesh and Sudarshan are with us with uh, their technical perspective on things. Gentlemen, good morning. Good to have both of you here. Mitesh, that question to you first. Uh, what's the strategy today? <coughs> uh, you know, I've been advocating a range of 21,500 to about 21,820. And saying that in case you break 21,500, we could go down for about 21,200. Now, that breakdown doesn't seem to happen today at least. So, I think today we'll start from the lower end of the range. We'll have a gap up. Um, there might be a mild inverted dip, but assuming that uh, the range holds, then I think we might head towards the upper end of the range. So, the idea is that wait for the gap up. If you get a 40, 50 point kind of a dip, try to buy there with a 50 point kind of a stop and look to take profits as we get closer to 21,750, 21,800. All right, Sudarshan Sukhani is also with us. Sudarshan, hi, good morning. Uh, are you feeling a little more hopeful that this market could now, you know, restart its uptrend? Or is it too soon to say that? I'm feeling cold. Delhi is shivering. And <laughs> while the temperature is not so low, because of the wind, it, it feels like zero. Okay, but that apart, I don't think this market is going anywhere. This is what we are going to see is a dead cat bounce. And uh, then the question was whether it will last. Even that answer is not possible. We can't say with any assurance that this rally today will last. This is not a good time to buy. You know, Sonia, we had a rally from 15th October to 31st December. I mean, how much more do you want? The markets have to pause and then they make everyone miserable if we start thinking that they will go higher and higher. The best advice to traders is not to trade since no one will listen to this buy on 150 point dips. Got it. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for that, uh, Sudarshan. Mitesh, let's come across to you. What about individual stocks? What are you looking at? Uh, morning, Najin. I have more of buy calls today. Uh, Tata Motors is a buy with a stop at 780. Look for a target of 810 to begin with. Another auto stock, that's TVS Motor. I would want to buy it about 2050, but looking at the fact that we'll have a gap up, good chance that we'll uh, see the stock price start beyond 2050. So buy then with a stop at 2026 for the first target of 2100. A buy on Manapuram with a stop at 176 for targets of 190 and one selling UPL around 564, 565. Take a small short position with a stop at 572 half for a target below 550. All right, let's talk about individual stocks then. So Darshan, what's on your list this morning? See, uh, because of that rally that we expect, there is there are buying opportunities. And it's much better to focus on stocks rather than the index. Hero Motor Corp is a buying opportunity. The stock fell and found support. Buy with the stock under 39.50. Mannapuram made a new closing high. That's very impressive. 175 is your stop loss. And it could also turn into a positional buy. Then Zydus Life has been having a rally from 550 to 715. You know, so many of these stealth rallies have been going on. Earlier, Sonia, for two and a half months, you just buy anything and that makes money. That won't happen now. Zydus is a buy with a stop under 698. And MFSL is an intraday short with a stop above 930. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for that, gentlemen. We'll come back to you all for a couple of more calls before market opens. 
For the time being, though, we'll slip into a short break. You come back, we'll get you pre-opened rates. We'll also be joined by Karun Tarani of Ilara Capital, put focus on media companies which have been passing off late, as well as the Z Sony merger. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Sneha said the derivatives research analyst at Angel One is joining in now to help us with some FNOQs for the day. Uh, Sneha, hi, good morning. How are you feeling about the market? Looks like it's going to be a good opening today, but do you think we can build on to that? Good morning. Let me see. Uh, yes, the opening might be good, but I think the kind of selling what we saw in yesterday's session, especially by the files where we have seen decent selling in index futures and writing and call option, apart from that, banking index also added huge short sales. So, considering this, I feel that if we are getting a bounce back today, uh, we should utilize that to, you know, add some shots, uh, someone who is trading for a day or two. Uh, and the person who is holding a positional trade should look to book their profits in case of any bounce. I think there can be a chances of further selling below the support zone of 2500. Hmm. Okay. Uh, in terms of individual trades, uh, <clears throat> what would you recommend? So I have a buy call and a sell call on one counter. Uh, first one is DBS Motor. I have a buy call on this. This counter had rallied clearly three first yesterday. The chart structure looks quite good. And I think there is a chance of uh, breakout beyond the uh, resistance what we have seen around uh, 20, 2016. Uh, so I would recommend buying this counter with a stick stop loss of 2010. And the target expected is around 2100. Apart from this, I have a sell on NMDC. Uh, this counter has given a very uh, smart rally uh, of late. And yesterday, we have seen decent sign of profit booking, wherein this counter was down by 3%. I believe we can see further selling pressure in this counter. So I would recommend buying a put option over here, 2100, uh, sorry, 210 put option uh, at the rate around uh, 4.5. And the stop loss can be maintained around 2.9. The target will be around 8. Uh, Sina, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, uh, thanks for those trades and uh, <clears throat> we'll talk to you again soon. Well, let's put the focus on, uh, <clears throat> you know, the media sector. Z uh, specifically perhaps is going to be one stock which should be in focus today. Uh, according to uh, news reports from Bloomberg and others, uh, Sony is planning to call off the $10 billion Z merger. Karan Torani of Vilara Capital is joining us right now. Karan, good morning. Good to have you with us here. Thanks very much. Uh, <clears throat> just sort of weigh in first off. What do you make of it? You think... Uh, as you've written in a, a quick note, it's a low probability event. Uh, explain why you think that. Uh, do you think it's just posturing at this stage? Uh, what's your sense? Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, so if you clearly see, I think in the past as well, you know, we have seen these kind of media reports of uh, you know the merger being called off or the merger being put at risk or something or the other happening in terms of a negative development. Uh, if you recall uh, the official statements, you know, made by both the companies around December third week, both were positive. Wherein you know Sony was uh, kind of uh, seeking some kind of clarity on Z in terms of uh, how do they want to go ahead in terms of the deal, and even Z responded saying that you know they are under fair negotiations. So I'm not saying that uh, you know uh, negotiations uh, wouldn't have uh, you know kind of become sour or something could have happened between them in terms of a negative bias. But it's too early to, you know, call off, you know, kind of uh, come to a conclusion that the deal will be called off. Uh, we'll await official statements, you know, from both the companies in terms of where things are panning out. And uh, logically, I think uh, all these things uh, do have a cutoff date. I think after this extension, I think in the next two weeks or three weeks rather, you will see clarity. You will see some official statement coming in from both the companies. And uh, there's a very low likelihood of Mr. Puri Puenka, you know, wanting to put the merger at risk just because of him being CEO, which Sony is not agreeing upon as of now. Uh, Karan, hi, good morning. You know, the problem is from an investor's POV, right? Uh, there's nothing that this stock has done in the last one year, despite such a big rally in the market. I mean, one year ago, the stock was at 230. Now it's about 270 or so, uh, given all this to and fro with the merger. Do you think it's best to just kind of avoid Z until you get more clarity on the situation? So I think if you look at the situation, I think there have been investors who have also entered at a price of 170, 180 uh, when the fall had happened. And if you just look at the price, you know, from that perspective, it has moved up more than 50%. Uh, from here on, I think in a best case scenario, the target could move to 340, 350 in our opinion. 
you know, after the merger happening. So it depends on in terms of risk reward. So at 170, risk reward was very, very favorable. At the current juncture, it is not. But again, the point is, I would not advise you investors to completely exit this stock because uh, there is still respite. I think the merger could go through. Uh, of course, uh, you know, there are negotiations. Now, let's look at it this way. Uh, Mr. Puneet, what he could have asked for, he could have asked, obviously, for the MDCO designation. He could have asked for, you know, becoming MDCO after SEBI gives him a clean shit. Or if he could have asked for a you know, higher non-compete fee or a board seat. These are the demands for potentially that could be, you know, from Mr. Puri. Uh, so negotiations are underway. And uh, we still would not like to give up completely on this. And the merger will fall through just purely basis media reports. And, I mean, there were earlier media reports as well, you know, pointing out that, uh, you know, the NCLT approval will not hold true if Mr. Puneet is not CEO. And that is completely untrue, right? Because clearly, NCLT and CCI approval is not basis who the CEO of the Moshko is. So I think a lot of uh, uh, dust in the air. I think we'll just wait and watch in terms of how things pan out officially. All right. Hi, Karan. Uh, good morning. Good to see you, Ben. Uh, Karan, I think you're factoring in high probability that this merger actually goes through, right? Yes, that's right. All right. You know, and for the time being, we have pre-opened rates and you have close around five, five lakh sellers on the counter. The stock is down close around 10%. So if you see further selling, will you recommend buying into the stock given the probabilities that you're factoring in, uh, you know, the merge entity goes through? And also, I think Mr. Goenka not at the helm. Yes, of course. I think if the stock moves, uh, you know, more than 10, 15% downwards, uh, we can recommend a buy to the uh, investors who would want to add on positions. Uh, because again, uh, as far as uh, the external environment is concerned, uh, even that is not very favorable right now. You know, Disney RIL talks are kind of, uh, you know, moving forward. They're gaining traction as well. So I think even that will put things at check. And this merger is equally important for both. It's not just for Z or for Sony, but for both is equally important. And uh, if at all this falls through because of Mr. Puneet, you know, wanting to be CEO and, you know, Sony pulling the plug, it's going to be a big loss for both entities put together. And both entities clearly know that. Mm. But unexpected and uh, low likelihood events do take place, right, Karan? So, uh, it's a bit of a binary situation. I, uh, I know which way, uh, well, you made it clear and the reasons why you're leaning on one side, that this perhaps will go through eventually, but it still is binary in that sense. Uh, so, f uh, so, from an actionable point of view, I mean, would it just make sense to wait uh, for, for clarity? Yes, of course, as I said, you know, official uh, qualifications need to come in the next two to three weeks and that will definitely come in. Uh, we don't see now on things, you know, moving beyond a month or two months or something of that sort. So it's a matter of time. Of course, it's binary. Uh, so one would call it that, you know, now the probability of the merger is maybe 70, 30 or 80, 20 uh, in favor of the merger, which was earlier 100% about three weeks ago. All right, uh, Karan, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in and uh, speaking to us about the Z-Sony merger, all the to and fro that we've seen. By the way, the market looks like it's going to have a solid opening this morning, 137 points in the green. Let's take a look at some of the big stocks. Bajaj Auto in pre-opening is a big mover, up almost 8 odd percent on the back of that massive buyback that they've announced. Tata Motors is up 1.5 percent on the back of the good uh, numbers that they reported for JLR. And a couple of other stocks, uh, Metropolis, uh, Keystone Realtors. Keystone Realtors is up about 1 percent. I think Gensol Engineering is also up in the green on the back of the order win that they've got on EVs. Uh, so, Gensol is up about, I think, 3-4% the last time I checked. But let's get some momentumizers going as well. Abhishek joins in. Uh, Abhishek, what's on your list? Uh, well, Kotick Mahindra Bank is on my radar with respect to Momentumizer. The stock has underperformed both Nifty and Bank Nifty over the last one week as well as last one month. So, on a weekly basis, uh, Kotick Mahindra Bank is down 3.75%, while Nifty is down a little more than 1%, and Bank Nifty is down about 1.6%. On a monthly basis, uh, Kotick Bank is down about 0.9% versus a gain of nearly 2.6% uh, for Nifty and about 0.4% gain that you are seeing on Bank Nifty. Uh, if you take a look at the volume data uh, yesterday's uh, total volume of about 2240 or crore is the highest that you are seeing in last three months or even more yesterday's delivery volume was about 81.6 percent uh, that is there on nse if you take a look at the stock price the stock is uh, right now trading at about 1826 uh, that is of closing yesterday and it is near the 200 uh, dma uh, 20 dma of 1861.4 as well as uh, you know 200 dma uh, which is about uh, uh, you know 1824 Back to you. Okay, all right. Uh, Abhishek, thanks very much for that. That's Kotak Mahindra Bank on the Momentumizers list. Uh, <clears throat> let's uh, <clears throat> talk about uh, Bandhan Bank. Let's revisit Bandhan Bank as well. Abhishek, back to you. Uh, this one was the big volume led loser yesterday. 
Uh, well, uh, sources <coughs> do tell CNBC TV 18 that there is no forensic audit uh, that is being done by the regulator, that is RBI. Now, detailed audit will be taken by CGFMU. Uh, now, CGFMU is credit guarantee uh, fund for, uh, you know, of micro units. So, audit by uh, CGFMU pertains to a claim of about 1200 to 1300 crore uh, that is being made by uh, Bandhan Bank. Now, audit is required as the claim value exceeds 1000 crore, which is a threshold uh, for for an audit to be done. If a claim is above 1000 crore, then an audit will be done. Uh, they have already hired an audit, uh, CGFMU, and the audit is in place. Uh, this is bank's second claim under CGFMU. Uh, you know, earlier claim of about 960 North crore has been received. Uh, so, detailed audit always follows a sample audit. Sample audit was done earlier, and now a detailed audit will take place. A uh, bank has about 2600 crore, uh, which has to be claimed by them uh, for the Assam related. Uh, issues that they had. Uh, Bandhan Bank is yet to respond to our story. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Let's get Mitesh in now. Mitesh, uh, lots of stocks are buzzing around. What's the big call at 910? We'll go with the buy on Tata Motors for a first target of 810. Then we'll look at 825 as well. Okay, a buy on Tata Motors. In fact, a lot of auto stocks are buzzing uh, today. So let me just take it uh, from Bajaj Auto, which is the biggest gainer right now. It's a big buyback from Bajaj Auto that they've announced. Uh, the share buyback of up to 4,000 crores at 10,000 rupees per share. So I think it's the premium on the share price which has been perplexing a lot of people on the street. Uh, this is a 43% premium, uh, percent premium to the last closing price and Bajaj Auto will be buying back 1.4% of equity shares of the company via the tender route. Uh, Tata Motors is the other one in the green strong wholesales in Q3. JLR in fact delivered the highest wholesale numbers in the last 11 quarters, a growth of 27% year-on-year and 4% quarter-on-quarter. The other stock I'm looking at this morning is TVS Motor. Now, Antique has come out with a downgrade on TVS, downgrade to a sell with a target of 1700. They say that it's only valuations that are concerning them. Valuations have run up ahead of fundamentals. They're building in a 12.5% volume compounded growth over FY23. To FY26. In fact, in just a while from now, we'll be speaking to the management of Bajaj Auto to talk about the buyback. So do stay tuned in for that. Um, and if you have any questions on that, you can write in to us on our social media platforms. We'll try and address them on air as well. But uh, Sonal is with us to talk about uh, the Jeffrey's report on the chemical space as well. Sonal, over to you. Uh, well, yes, Jeffries has written about the sector and they say that inventory rationalization is still expected to continue till first half of calendar year 24. So there's no recovery inside in the near term. Growth is normalizing towards historical averages by end of calendar year 2024. But Latin America, European Union and Asia, they are still very weak. Uh, they say that Chinese exports of crop protection products, there are 40% on a YY basis. And that is something which is putting pressure on global chem chemical prices. And that's why there's a lot of pressure on domestic companies as well. Uh, refrigerant gas prices. They have fallen 40% since March. There is Chinese dumping. There is weak domestic demand as well. So they have uh, spoken about different companies. PI Industries is their top pick. They say it is better placed than peers in the destocking cycle with healthy volume growth likely in FY25. SRF has been downgraded to underperform because they see weakness in their specialty chemicals business. And that's why they have lowered their FY24, FY25 EPS by 18 and 12% respectively. They say they are staying away from Naveen Chlorine because the MD is still not being uh, reinstated and growth will be back only if there's some clarity on the managing director and CEO and that's why they are a little cautious on the chemical space. All right, uh, so uh, <clears throat> thanks for that but you know we're talking about another space now. One is chemicals which has been down in the dumps but real estate which is flying high and uh, Jeffries has got something to say here as well. Well, now they are saying that they are ahead of their valuations. They've seen a massive surge and that's why they've downgraded some of these stocks. Uh, Jeffrey says that low inventories and mid-cycle affordability should support 20% residential growth in 2024. Offices are also bottoming out because of the new SEZ rule that has come out and that's why they're positive on REITs as well. Um, demand is higher in the commercial space. They have raised the mine space to REIT uh, uh, valuation to a buy and they've upgraded the stock that is. Uh, developer stocks, they doubled in 2023 that's all that we've been talking about in that year but expectations are high now easy scale up is now behind and that's why they have uh, uh, downgraded a lot of these stocks cut target prices as well they've downgraded prestige to an underperform soba to a hold and that's the reason they're slightly cautious on real estate as well now okay thanks a lot for that i just wanted to spot a couple of more stocks for you before uh, you know the markets open there is the irb infra which is up almost three percent right now the toll collection in december was quite strong actually 
26% growth is what we saw in the toll collection at a little under 500 crores. The street definitely likes that. And Metropolis is picking up some pace now. So the core business growth has been very strong in Q3. It's a 12% growth. Actually, the volume growth is, is still in single digits. So I don't know how the street is going to look at that. But still, the stock um, you know, is up and about. Bandhan Bank, by the way, I think uh, there is yeah the, the news break has been confirmed. Bandhan Bank has said that there's no forensic audit by the RBI regulator. And the audit will be by the CGFMU. So um, it, this was a sample audit for the CGFMU claim. So maybe some relief over there on Bandhan Bank up almost about 3 odd percent. So plenty of stocks actually in the green. And overall for the market, as we are counting down to uh, the opening, Mitesh is still with us. Mitesh, looks like it's going to be a good one. But post this gap up opening, how do you approach it? Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, as I said, uh, since we are ranging and we are kind of consolidating between 21,500 and 820, I think don't buy into the gap up immediately. Post the gap up, if you get a 40, 50 point kind of a dip, then try to take longs with a 50 point stop. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Well, we'll just get the pre-opening, the opening rates actually for the market in just a while from now. Remember, the uh, start is expected to be strong. How the second half of the day pans out, uh, only time will tell. But we've had a strong update from across the globe. The Dow is up over 200 points. Crude prices have fallen as well. FIs and DIs have both bought in the cash markets yesterday. So there are, um, you know, the fundamentals are in place for the market to open well in the green. Now, a couple of things, right? I think the market is squarely focused on what happens with India's inclusion in the Bloomberg bond index. And if that happens, there could be a lot of buying coming through from FIs, DIs, from the retail community. And sentiment is positive uh, because of that. Some reports suggesting that an inflow perhaps of around 2 to $3 billion over a five-month period if and when India gets included in the Bloomberg bond index. All right, here you go. First tick on the index, very strong, up 130 points. The Nifty holding on strong above the 21,600 mark. The mid-cap index well in the green, flying off the shelf actually right now. <laughs> And if you look at individual stocks, it's Bajaj Auto that's topping the charts 5% higher on the back of the buyback. Uh, Tata Motors is up 1.5% as well, strong GLR sales. And IT stocks have come back. So Wipro, Infosys, LTI, Mindtree are all in the green. Metal stocks are not too bad either. Tata Steel is in the green as well. Auto stocks, Hero Motor Corp, um, along with Bajaj and Tata Motors are trending higher. So two-wheelers are looking pretty good. Uh, apart from that, Titan, Sipla, Coal India, JSW Steel are a couple of other names that are trending in the green right now. Uh, guess what? There is no nifty stock in the red. So the sentiment is very, very upbeat this morning. The mid-cap index is soaring away. So all the action really is in the mid-cap space and Nigel will take us through that. But the advanced decline ratio is also very comfortable at uh, almost, I mean, it's not comfortable, it's rocking actually right now. 13 is to 1 in favour of the advances so looking very good. When, when Sonia uses the term rocking, it is indeed <laughs> rocking. You know, from the broader markets as well, plenty of stocks that are rocking around here. Buyer B Infra, December toll collection up close around 26%. That's one of the top volume gainers as well, up close around 5% as we speak. GMDC, they've got environment clearance for one of those mines to increase capacity from around 3 to around 5 million tonnes odd. That's good for the Lignite business, but I think the street is betting more on the other parts of the business. You know, what can they come up with in terms of rare earth minerals? That's the bigger trigger for the stock from year on. For the time being, though, up close to around 3.5%. What else doing well? Pandan Bank, they said that there's no audit by the RBI, but a sample audit by CGFMU claims. Uh, you know, Abhishek Kotari had brought us that story, and now the management is confirming that as well. So that's another big mover. What's not doing well? Z, that's under pressure, down close to around 7%. Uncertainty on the merger, so that's why that stock is a little bit lower. And a couple of other big volume movers, you have Trident, that's one of the top volume movers on the NSE, that's up uh, in today's trading session in the first couple of minutes. You have Jyoti Structures as well, another smaller name in there that's moving higher. So keep an eye out on the broader markets, plenty of stocks that are moving around. The headline index is now up 150 points and I'll tell you what, the Nifty Bank is holding at 47,750, we're 60 points away from the 20 DMA, you'll want to track that mark, 47,810, crucial mark for the Nifty Bank as well. Okay, well, uh, you know, so it's a, a good-looking screen. It's actually a fantastic-looking screen. 150 points on the Nifty is uh, what we have now. And, uh, you know, the Nifty Bank is up about 0.6% or so, which is about 290 uh, points. You know, the <clears throat> level to uh, simply watch is yesterday's high. For the Nifty, that is 21,764. Uh, that is still 100 points away from where we are right now. But, uh, you know, you get to that, you stay above it. 
uh, and uh, it starts to look a lot better once again. Uh, price momentum wise, that will be true. Z is bounced off a little bit uh, off the lows and you can see it at the bottom of the screen. I think at one point was down almost uh, a full 10%. It's down about 7.8, 7.9%. Uh, stocks at about uh, 256. Big, big volumes on Z uh, at uh, this point in time. Let's just uh, take a look at a few other names before we <clears throat> sort of uh, welcome in our market master. Trident, which went up, which was limit up yesterday. It's up another 8%. Uh, stocks at about 52, but humongous volumes on Trident. Look at that, 50 million shares uh, on uh, Trident right now. These textile companies, Alok Industries is another one, 10% higher, uh, 40 rupees. Again, volumes are humongous uh, coming through there. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, maybe we can put up uh, Sula, Sula on the downside, it went, Sula went, uh, was limit up yesterday. It's down about 3%, pulling back a little bit. That's about it. I think we mentioned GMDC earlier, which is uh, doing very well. Uh, Brigade Enterprises from the real estate space is coming up with volumes. It's got about a 5 odd percent gain. Uh, stocks at 992. Uh, there is Punjab National Bank. It, it pulled back about 2-3% yesterday. It's coming back about one and a half odd percent right now. Uh, Adani Ports was one of the top nifty gainers yesterday. It's up another 1.6-1.7% uh, as, uh, you know, the <coughs> trading starts uh, <coughs> this morning. Just a, f uh, a few names on the downside. All Cargo Logistics is down 8%. Uh, you know, stocks at about 82 and uh, there's a sharp cut uh, coming through on All Cargo. Uh, and uh, there's Z Media, which is down about 6% or so as well. <clears throat> I mean, 16, 16 and a half, but there are volumes. That's why I'm uh, mentioning that. Colgate is another one, which is down about 1.6, uh, 1.7%. <clears throat> so it's that kind of a start. More up than down, market breadth looking pretty solid. And the Nifty, all in all, uh, everything told, is up 130 odd points or so. You know, I just want to make a point on Z, right? Uh, yeah. The stock is taking quite a big knock right now. And as even Karan <coughs> Karani was saying, this could be a long standoff. Yeah. I mean, Sony not wanting uh, Puneet Goenka to be CEO and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the Goenka standing their ground. So things are getting really murky, especially in the last couple of months. And in terms of a timeline, so if you are a shareholder of Z, for example, you don't know which way this is going to head mm. because nobody wants to, sit, you know... Uh, change their stance. Yeah, uh, it, I mean, you know, Karan, of course, clearly believes that this is more than anything else posturing. He's he's clearly yeah. saying that this will go through mm. and it'll take a month, two months. But he's, but it's a binary no kind of an knows, event. We don't know. Right? I mean, nobody yeah. knows. It's we, just a guess that you're taking. Your guess is as good as mine sort of situation. No, that's what, I mean, <laughs> but uh, he's making that bet. Let's see. I mean, 9% lower is what we have and uh, very large volumes at this point in time. Gautam Dugat is with us. He's our market master of the day, head of research institutional equities at Motilo Social Financial Services. Gautam, uh, best wishes in the new year. Thanks very much for being here on CNBC TV 18. Prashant, this side. Uh, you know, just let's just kick it off with uh, earnings. And, uh, you know, I was looking at the uh, earnings preview, <coughs> so the detailed note uh, which uh, you guys put out. And I just want to begin with IT services because there has been so much uh, talk and debate about <coughs> what now. Stocks uh, presumably have moved up even before recovery there has started. How, what should we expect uh, in the third quarter from ID services and what would you want to hear from companies? Because results we will get from Infosys and TCS on Thursday. Hi, good morning Prashant uh, and Sonia. Uh, Happy New Year to you and your viewers. Thanks for having me. Uh, yes, uh, this quarter is going to be a bit lackluster and uh, given the fact that you have more furloughs this time, and the commentary which has come in, you know, uh, from the other companies too over the last three, four months, the expectations are really muted, Prashant, so much so that, you know, just statistically, this is the first quarter after 26 quarters where we are expecting a YOI decline in IT earnings. You know, it's not much, it's just 2%. And if any big company reports a slightly better other income, it might even turn out to be a flattish quarter. But yes, at least in the preview, the number that we are expecting is a minus 2-3% kind of an earnings sprint. But besides number in IT, what always matters is the guidance, you know, what kind of commentary they have for FY25. Maybe it's not the right time for the companies. They may not speak much about FY25, but some clarity and visibility on the demand will definitely help because we have seen uh, big companies cutting guidances multiple times over the last eight, nine months. You know, I remember when we started the year in April, our expectations for IT for FY24 was earnings growth of 10, 12%. And as we are in March, January now, that expectation has gone down to just about a flat number for FY24 over FY23. 
So some bit of uh, visibility on demand will definitely help. Margins are fine, I think, for IT sector. They're normalized after the pre-COVID levels. But demand is something which constantly remains a worrying factor, uh, especially in the large-cap IT, because mid-cap IT seems to have done reasonably well over the last two, three years. Some of them are at uh, crazy valuations also. But yes, uh, to answer your specific question, the demand visibility is something which I think most of the street will be uh, glued to. Okay. Um, Gautam, hi, good morning. I want to talk about the auto sector because in your note, you mentioned that BFSI and the auto sector will continue to lead uh, and you have some of your top picks in that sector, including names like m and etc. But uh, I want to know that uh, the rally has been quite swift, right, in the last one year. Uh, do you see uh, even uh, spaces like two-wheelers, for example, build on to these gains this year? Uh, looks like so, Sonia, because uh, auto sector has come back into reckoning after a very flat earnings for five years. In FY18 to FY23, the nifty auto earnings remained flattish. In between, they went up and down. But it ended FY23 exactly at the same point where the FY18 earnings were. And then in FY24, we have seen earnings go up 100% for auto sector. So from 28,000 odd crores to 57,000. And the rally that you mentioned in auto sector is partly a reflection of what has happened to the underlying demand margins and consequently the earnings growth. As we step into FY25, obviously this large base will play some spoiled sport uh, in a uh, overall aggregate scenario. Our expectations for full year FY25 is 10% growth. But yes, for the quarter, that is third quarter FY24, we are building in a 35% growth in auto sector earnings, with decent margin expansion, Auto volume numbers are already there, they have been disclosed. So uh, as far as the sector is concerned, from our model portfolio stance, we have moderated our overweight there. We are largely equal weight now. So about a year back, we had close to 200, 300 basis point of an overweight on, uh, on auto. Now it is a bit more flattish equal weight kind of a scene uh, with m and and Hero being our top idea, as you rightly mentioned. Two-wheeler, obviously, there is clear positive shift in demand patterns over there, as we've witnessed uh, over the last two quarters. Uh, while the festive season has not gone down too well, uh, as one would have imagined uh, or envisaged a couple of uh, months back, but the valuations for two-wheelers, specifically both Hero and Bajaj, are still uh, kind of okay, uh, you know, in, a, in the sector. And on four-wheeler, our preference for a long time has been with m and Okay, all right. Uh, hi, Gautam. Uh, good morning and uh, good to see you in. Wishing you a cracking 2024, Gautam. Uh, I wanted your view on the domestic-facing themes. You know, they have really been the way to play this market. But getting into an election year, maybe we'll see some order intakes that will slow down. Some of these companies could see a bit of a slowdown in terms of order intake. How do you uh, approach them? Do you believe some of them still opportunity uh, offer good opportunity? Because the problem is in the last year, as orders started coming in, market capitalization more than reflected that. Your view. But Nigel, uh, yeah, hi, uh, happy new year. But Nigel, that's how uh, this sector has always behaved in cycle, right? Uh, you know, sometimes uh, the stock prices or market caps anticipate uh, what is going to happen in the order books and uh, it discounts it too fast. And that is exactly the situation we are in right now. If you look at the kind of market cap uh, creation which has happened in industrials, defense, power, all those kind of sectors uh, in the last 18, 24 months, Obviously, the business has not kept pace with the market cap growth uh, to that same extent. So a lot of the good news is already there in the price. But you know, the sector has come back into the reckoning after almost a decade of going nowhere. And there are many sectors like that, you know, in, industrials being one, power being another one, real estate, utilities. These sectors had been forgotten from 2012 to almost 2020, 2021. It's only in the last two years you're seeing some buoyancy happening there, and for the right reasons. Uh, the, the order book creation, the CapEx creation, infra as a theme, PLI as a theme, manufacturing as a theme, all of them are coming together. And that is what is resulting into a lot of positivity around the CapEx theme uh, for this country. We've seen government leading the CapEx earlier part of the cycle. Now there are hopes and some sort of uh, uh, you know signs that private CapEx will also follow. The problem, Nigel, in this sector is of uh, uh, is of valuations, right? Uh, we are positive on this space. Uh, we have a big overweight there. We have added ABB also. We have Kirloskar Oil and LNT. We've been holding a big position for a long time now. Uh, we've also increased our weight in uh, real estate big time from 1% to almost 4% now. 
So while we are positive, we are fully cognizant of the fact that uh, valuations are quite rich and companies will have to deliver on execution uh, because uh, the price for not delivering uh, given where valuations are can be quite brutal. All right. Uh, well, I just want to point out that uh, there are a lot of stocks which are moving around right now. GMDC has picked up quite a bit of pace. Uh, I think I checked out. It's a uh, it's a ten percent rally that we're seeing on GMDC right now. And of course, there have been a lot of uh, you know reasons, uh, positive updates coming in over there. They've received their environmental clearance for the capacity expansion uh, approval from three million tons per annum to five million tons per annum. So as we would, as uh, even uh, Nigel was highlighting earlier. So GMDC is a big mover, 10% higher now. You know, GMDC, Sonia, is one of those stocks. Any bit of good news will be very, very good. I believe I'm just trying to get further details. But this expansion that they got, actually, from this particular mine, there's not much output as of now, though they've got an expansion. Mm. You know, so any trigger of good news, we see the stock flying away because the street is so optimistic uh, out there. So let's see how this goes. But I think the bigger trigger for them is how their volumes ramp up with regard to the lignite business and what kind of an opportunity the rare earth minerals. You know, for the last, I think, two years, we've been talking to the management. They're saying they're working on it. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to see num numbers coming out of there as well. For the time being, I remember we covered the stock two years ago, yeah. 135. Now it's nearly 500 rupees. Oh, of course, one of to those... show the kind of positive rub off, the kind of interest yeah. in the stock. Interest in the stock. And it's created a lot of wealth for shareholders. Uh, so that's a good thing. But uh, Gautam, uh, you know, I was going through, since we're talking mid-caps, right, let's take a look at your portfolio as well. Uh, one of the stocks that you've liked is this entire consumption space. So whether it's Zomato, whether it is Indian hotels, uh, a couple of others in this space as well, Lemon Tree Hotels. Uh, do you think the hotel space has become a little bit of a crowded trade now? Because anyone and everyone knows that there are some big events underway now with this whole Maldives situation as well. Uh, you know, Lakshadweep is picking up in a big way. There's the Ayodhya launch that's happening later this month. Uh, the Ram Mandir opening. So, do you think a lot of this has been priced into the hotel space or do you think there's more to go? <laughs> Sonia, yes, it will be uh, foolish to disregard the fact that all of that is already in the price. But also fact remains that this is a sector which has seen uh, a big downturn for almost 10 to 12 years after 2008 to 2020. Uh, possibly we are in the second or third year of an up cycle. And uh, I think this up cycle can last few more years because your supply uh, in, a, in a basic, it's not a commodity sector, but it's a cyclical sector. And cyclical sector supply always has a very important role to play uh, in the pricing and thus the operating levels and consequently the market cap creation. Uh, right now, where we are sitting, it looks quite conceivable that uh, for the hotel sector, the demand supply dynamics can remain in favor of the hotel players. And given the fact that you're seeing exclusion of demand in the domestic uh, side, given the events of the last few days, and also the fact that a lot of events have taken place in CY23, some of them could continue in CY24. I think ARR, occupancy, REPA, a lot of those parameters are still giving you green signals on hotels. So we will remain very constructive here, which is why we've been holding both the hotel stocks in our model portfolio for more than a year and a half now. And uh, some of them are also part of our CY24 top ideas. All right, uh, Gautam, uh, we will leave it at that. But I request you to <clears throat> listen in for a tad bit. We're having the management of Bajaj Auto to talk about their buyback, right? They announced that massive buyback. So we'd like you to stay back, listen in, and maybe even give your thoughts at the end of the discussion. Uh, Bajaj Auto is the biggest, one of the biggest gainers right now. There's a 4,000 crore buyback that has been approved <laughs> at a price of 10,000 rupees per share. Nobody expected that. That's a 43% premium to yesterday's closing price. Dinesh Thapar, the CFO of Bajaj Auto, is joining us now to talk about that. Uh, Mr. Thapar, good morning. First, if you can explain the rationale behind such a big premium on the price and also, uh, you know, what the plan is going ahead. Good morning, Sonia. So, uh, you know, board approved a buyback of 4,000 crores, as you rightly pointed out, at 10,000 pieces of share. So essentially about 4 million shares that we are looking to mop up as part of this buyback. Uh, it's about 16% of our uh, paid up share capital and free reserves. And therefore, uh, this is subject to shareholder approval. And, and we'll run through that process between now uh, and the middle of uh, February. But coming into the rationale, uh, Sonia, and I know it may, it may have taken many by surprise, but look, at when we discussed this at the board yesterday, what we had was uh, one marker, which was essentially 
looking at a history of precedent transactions that have happened, which suggested that normally price premiums range anywhere between 25 and 30 percent uh, over prevailing price. And that was one market that the board had, could have taken a very mathematical view about it and said, you know, let's apply anywhere in the ballpark of 25 and 30 percent. But what the board chose to do, and uh, you know, we reflected on this and had an extensive discussion at the board, was to really use this as an opportunity to reflect on our performance over this last little while, which has really been uh, quite compelling and really outperforming in terms of the broader industry. But as much, mm -hmm. uh, from a point of view on the outlook for this business uh, as we look ahead, and therefore, how does that in turn reflect into the valuation of this business? Uh, and that's how we arrived at the 10,000 crores. And let me give you a little bit of a sense of the underlying thinking and why we feel confident uh, of putting that price out over there. So I think if you look at the two-wheeler business, it's you know it's weathered a perfect storm over the last few years. And I think things have now started to look up over the last 12, 15 months. Uh, mm -hmm. Clearly, a lot of the pricing of the product uh, that was a challenge that saw Jesus. demand get dampened is now coming back. Affordability is coming back in a big way. The markets are relatively buoyant, and we've seen that reflected uh, in the commentary of ourselves and across the broader industry. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a transformation that's un uh, underway in which Bajaj Auto is, is playing a fair share and really investing quite substantially. Uh, and then there is, of course, the commodity markets, which are relatively stable, which over well uh, for us to be able to drive operating margin and profitability whilst making mm. very competitive investments. So when you look at the broader industry, I'd say a very compelling outlook in terms of where we stand. Now, against that, if you look at Bajaj sure. Auto in yeah. particular, I think we've got a business now which is firing on all cylinders. Our domestic business starting over the last you know, 15 months has been on momentum, on song, in motorcycles business, take every part of it. In the motorcycles business today, you know, the strategic segment of the 125cc, which is really where we've got much of our focus on, uh, we've now, We've been growing ahead of market. We've been growing share. Uh, and in mm. December, you would have heard and, and noticed that we've clearly taken pole position. So we're now the largest 125 plus CC motorcycle player in this country, right? And that, and there's much more in the offing on that front. Uh, the addition of Triumph to the portfolio, very exciting, clearly can provide a fillip to potentially double our premium motorcycle business over the next few years uh, in the short term and clearly much more as we look even forward and it opens up an export opportunity on that front as well. When you look mm -hmm. at our commercial vehicles sure. business, really, we've restated that. And, you know, now with the addition of the E3 wheelers, which has been well received, that opens up a whole new vista of opportunity for us. Uh, and Got on electrification, uh, E2 Dinesh? wheelers, clearly so much more. Absolutely. Right. No, uh, no, that's great to hear that the fundamental performance has improved quite a bit. Just on the buyback, I wanted a couple of more details. Why did you decide to yeah. do just 1.4% equity? Why was it such a small amount? Is there any rationale behind that? And also, will the promoters be participating in the buyback? If yes, what will the stake be post? So, Toya, we've, we've picked 4,000 crores, uh, clearly a strong balance sheet, and uh, we would have ended the year uh, in the ballpark of about 20,000 crores of cash. We had our last published balance sheet in September. We were at 17,500 crores then, having added about 3,500 crores of free cash flow uh, in the first half of this year. I'm not in a position to share with you what are three numbers, but if you just extrapolate that, we would have ended off with about 20,000 crores. Uh, our Performance so far in FY24 is clearly ahead of expectations. We had 3,500 crores of PAT uh, in the middle of the year. And, you know, if you extrapolate that into the full year, that gives you a sense that we could be anywhere between 25 to 30 percent over the last year, which was essentially 5,600 last year. And so therefore, that provides headroom for a larger buyback size. We did 2,500 crores last year. And the intention is to do 4,000 crores of consideration this year, Sonia. But when you look at it in terms of an outlay, there's another 1,000 crores that will go behind buyback tax and and and, uh, and transaction costs. So essentially, we'd be spending about 4950 behind this buyback. Uh, and then, of course, the intention was to really uh, come in with a size which was larger than last year, which is the 2,500 crores, essentially to take cognizance of the fact that we've got stepped up performance uh, and a bigger year uh, in play for us over here. So that's really the 4,000 crores and the reason why we opted for that. Strong balance sheet, stepped up performance, and a bigger PAT pool, uh, which allows us for a higher distribution. The promoters the... will participate, and that's what we yeah. put out as well. Okay, so the promoters will participate. So currently, promoters hold about 54.9% stake. Uh, what will the promoter's stake be post the buyback and, you know, what is the uh, the promoter's stake expected to be at over, say, the next uh, uh, one to two years? 
Yeah, so sorry, if we simulate this, the promoters will not end up diluting because we think, uh, you know, with, with the current pricing that we've put out, it presents a very compelling proposition for uh, for uh, investors and, and shareholders to really uh, make their full entitlement. And therefore, if that was to be the case, uh, the promoters will, will tender in, in line with their entitlement. To that extent, I expect post buyback shareholding for them not to be diluted. In fact, it might creep up slightly because we've also got a 15% reservation for small shareholders over here. So when you do the maths on a post buyback percentage, uh, you know, the promoter uh, holding, uh, assuming everyone tenders in line with their entitlement, uh, should be at about the same limits or a tad higher. Dinesh, hi, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> Prashant here. Uh, it, you know, it's a uh, congratulations. I, I don't know if congratulations is the right way to begin, but 10,000 is a big number and shows confidence, right? Uh, that uh, well, that your, yeah, no, <clears throat> it does. And uh, thanks for explaining the rationale uh, pretty well. I just had two uh, sort of points that <clears throat> I want you to uh, address. One is, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the CAPEX requirement, because you're investing into new segments, uh, EVs, etc. What is that uh, likely to be? If you can give us some color, and second, uh, you did briefly mention the under uh, the under 125 cc segment. Uh, you know, the 125 plus cc. You're, I think, now you got 35 percent plus kind of share, but the, at the lower end, uh, you know, what are the trends you're seeing? Because that is a segment which has been hurting. The premium end is doing just fine, and you're doing uh, exceptionally well. Go on. So uh, let, let's take the second question first. So I think, uh, you know, for a period of time, we've now been saying our strategic focus has been in growing the 125cc segment. There is a shift that is structurally happening year after year uh, in favor of the, the 100, 110cc moving up to 125. We are well positioned in that space. Pulsar is clearly leading. Our brand Pulsar is clearly leading in that space. And uh, I just didn't mention that we've now taken pole position and, and are the largest in, in that space. Uh, if you look at our performance in this last little while, because the volume numbers are out in public, domain for, for the last quarter, uh, we've grown overall uh, you know, at 2x over the industry. Uh, it is a bit of a dilution that we have on the on the 100, 110, the, or the M1, M2, as, as the market calls it. Uh, but we've grown significantly ahead of market, uh, over 3, 4x uh, on the 125 CC plus to allow us to grow 2x in line with the overall market. So. So that's how it is. Uh, demand in, in December, which really was uh, was the month after the big festive season or the big uh, Diwali and Dasera held out. Uh, and so we've done quite well, and you see that reflected in our quarter three numbers. All right. Uh, hi, Dinesh. Uh, Nigel on this side. Congratulations. Good going for your shareholders. And uh, as a consumer and as a rider, I enjoy riding the new bikes that you're putting out. And as I asked Rajiv as well, hopefully we'll see even bigger bikes coming out of Bajaj Auto. But, uh, you know, I want to focus on the electric vehicle space. We have Mr. Sharma that joins us on a monthly basis. Rajiv as well was talking yes. about that number moving from around 10,000 to around 15,000. Now, there's value unlocking that people are talking about. At a particular point of time, could this be carved out into a separate entity, the electric vehicle space? Because we have seen you outpacing the market growth out there as well. Yes. Yes, Nigel, and I think a uh, very pertinent observation. I think uh, when you look at uh, how we've progressed on, on the electric two-wheeler business, you know, we've we've taken short but steady steps uh, to really build out our business. Uh, you know, if you rewind to 12 months back uh, in the league tables, we'd have been number seven, number eight. Today, we're at number three. Uh, and the ambition most definitely does not stop there. Uh, we're continuing to invest, and you will see uh, that the, the funnel of innovation is clearly well populated. And I think uh, uh, over a period of time, you will see a lot of that being brought to market. Clearly a lot of work that's happening on the cost front as well. Uh, so I think all guns blazing in terms of building out our capabilities on winning uh, you know, in, in the electric two-wheeler space. We've also got the electric three-wheeler, uh, which I think uh, you know, the market must, mustn't must forget that that is out there, that's been well received and has already started to receive uh, a very strong response and has uh, hit market leadership in the early cities that we've already launched in the first few months of already getting in over there. So a very strong emphasis on building out the electric business, uh, uh, Nigel. We already have an entity in, in JTAC technology that allows us possible flexibility on structures in, in the future as and when we choose to do it. But I think this at this point of time, we're single-mindedly focused 
on really building and scaling up volume. We move from 3,000 units a month to 10,000. Uh, next pit stop is to get to 15 and then possibly up to 20. Uh, but the idea is to very clearly build volume, really build our capabilities in the space and build uh, a sustainable business model, uh, well, which is which is really cost competitive and allows us for, uh, for us to be able to expand without a significant drag on margin. The good thing is that we've got an ICE business, which is on song at the moment at 20%, and therefore we're able to register 20% enterprise margin. But this is after coming uh, on the back of investments that we are making in the electric business. So I think there's a fair amount of work that's happening over there. I think to a question that Prashant uh, uh, asked. Uh, our CapEx requirement is, is about 1,000 crores over the last couple of years. Uh, as we are stepping up, most of this investment is going behind really building uh, facilities uh, and, mm. and R&D for our EV business. And of course, putting up a new factory that we did in Chakan for our Triumph business right. and both potentially right. New revenue stream that can add significantly to Bajaj Auto's okay. revenues as as we look forward. Uh, so really, on a free cash flow basis, we feel quite confident, and that therefore allows us to be able to make very significant payouts uh, as we currently have done in the last year, where we paid out over a hundred percent. And mm. this year, we've already done a big buyback uh, of about yes. five thousand crores from this cash out. In the next two to three years, could we see a separate listed entity, Bajaj Electric Vehicles? I'm not going to comment on that. We have the structure that is out there, which allows us the flexibility to do that. But I think at this point okay. of time, we're single-mindedly focused on building out that business, growing scale, growing the network, uh, putting out much more, which is already in, in, in the R&D product development uh, funnel, uh, and really growing our positions, our competitive positions uh, in, in the electric space. All right, uh, Dinesh, uh, it was a pleasure speaking to you, actually. We don't see you very often on the channel. We hope to see you a lot more because we got a lot of, uh, you know, interesting information and I'm sure shareholders are happy uh, to hear from you as well. All the best and thanks a lot for joining in. That's Bajaj Auto, one of the big movers this morning, up 2%. Uh, I mean, it's 2% today, but if you just map the journey, right, in the last six months, the stock has given you a 50% return. Just look at that uh, stratospheric move on that stock, doubled in the last 12 months. Slip into a quick break. On the other side of the break, Sivaram Krishnan Ganpati of Gokuldas Exports will be joining in to talk about the impact of the Red Sea tensions on their exports. Later in our special segment, quarter se quarter tak, Reema will talk about what to expect from the IT sector in Q3. Also, Kamaljeet Saluja of Kotak will be with us to discuss his expectations from the IT sector. Okay, welcome back. Uh, the market's pulled back a little bit. We're, uh, what, uh, 100 points uh, higher. We were up 150 uh, when we started. 21,600 is where we are at. Now, uh, textile companies have been doing very well. I mean, <clears throat> you know, uh, and a whole host of reasons uh, behind it. And this actually, uh, you know, coming despite the fact that, uh, you know, when you talk about textile companies and apparel makers, exports is a large uh, sort, of, uh, sort of component of, the, of their businesses. And uh, shipping rates, etc., have gone through the roof, as we've been highlighting over the last couple of days. Uh, there are individual triggers uh, for lots of these companies as well. And uh, we're talking to one such company. Gokul does exports is uh, what I'm referring to. <clears throat> we have uh, Sivar, uh, Sivar Ramakrishnan, Ganapati, uh, uh, Vice Chairman and Managing Director of Gokul does exports, joining in right now to uh, take some uh, questions. Uh, Mr. Ganapati, good morning. Great to have you with us here. Good morning. Uh, wish, uh, season's greetings in uh, 2024. First time I think we're speaking with you this year. Actually, we've Thank not you. spoken with you, uh, I think, <clears throat> for a while. And I want to begin with <clears throat> something that I wanted to ask you uh, before we get into, you know, the business intricacies, etc. Uh, there was a <clears throat> share sale by you, uh, which happened some time back. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, the market, uh, I, I guess, took that as a bit of a signal because that essentially was also the high, in a way, the top for the stock. At least, I mean, you know, since that point on, and there have been other kind of factors affecting the stock price. It's not just that. But I just wanted you to explain what was the rationale behind it and, uh, uh, you know, how much did you sell? What is your holding now? And what should we expect from here? So I just sold enough to, uh, you know, repay my ESOP loan. So when I had uh, exercised my ESOP uh, to pay taxes, I had taken some loan. So I had, uh, uh, I had this loan, uh, you know, overhang over me. So for that, as well as from, you know, some personal loan for housing, et cetera, which I had taken, I just wanted to square off. But principally what I sold was meant for uh, 
paying back uh, the ESOP loan that I had taken. So that was it. I still hold uh, 10 lakh shares in the company. I have uh, ESOPs worth another 8 lakh shares. So I'm, I'm all of that is intact and I'm very much invested in the company. No more share sales, uh, Mr. Ganpati? I mean, at least not in the foreseeable future? No. Okay. Mm. Okay. All right. Uh, hi, Mr. Ganapati. Good morning. Nigel on this side. Good and uh, wishing you all the best for 2024. Well, I wanted to ask you. you about this entire Red Sea conflict that's taking place. You know, has mm -hmm. it impacted trade for you? And, uh, you know, could you tell us that the freight costs have moved up? So that will hurt you all as well? No, it won't because we usually do FOB business. So, okay. so the customers uh, aggregate all the uh, goods and then uh, pay for shipping. So, so you know they not only uh, aggregate across India but they aggregate across the region as well. So they have long-term contracts with uh, likes of Musk and others. Uh, so, so they bear the shipping cost. So, from our perspective, uh, the increase in shipping cost is on the customers' books, not on our books. So, there is no impact whatsoever. On the contrary, because the shipping times have increased, some of the customers are asking for, uh, you know, uh, advancing the deliveries a bit. So, so that we're dealing with. Some of them are also trying to airlift uh, just to uh, fill the shortcomings or shortfall in their uh, warehouses. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's being handled well between our logistics and their logistics. But at the moment, uh, we're not uh, incurring any cost. When it comes to imports, because we also buy raw materials, most of the imports come from uh, the Far East, and that's not impacted by the Red Sea uh, situation. So we don't have any import cost increases. And on the export side, uh, since most of the goods go to the West, uh, the, the costs are borne by the customer. That's good to hear. So the costs are borne by the customer, so you don't bear any costs on your books. But you know, given the kind of delays that we are seeing, the kind of uh, uh, perhaps pressure that the customers are facing, uh, do mm -hmm. you expect that this could have some impact on your own earnings? I mean, in any way, uh, just trying yeah. to understand that. Because the last time when we spoke to you, you told us that even Q2, Q3 earnings could continue to be under pressure before things improve. But how is the situation right now? So when I look at, uh, you know, from, from an earnings perspective or uh, brand's perspective, I don't think, uh, you know, this will have any impact uh, on, on their buying. Uh, of course, it will uh, it'll reduce their margins a bit, but I think they will also have adequate, uh, you know, negotiation power with the uh, freighters. Uh, coming to how the situation looked like for us, if I look at uh, the order book going all the way up to Q1, I draw a lot of comfort. Uh, things seems to be coming back. If I look at the uh, holiday season sales, they were pretty okay uh, and pretty decent in the West. And when I look at my Q4 and Q1, uh, you know, order book, it seems to be uh, coming up well. So, so, you know, things are improving as we speak from a demand perspective. We'll uh, watch how the uh, U.S. markets perform in calendar 24 uh, and, you know, how, how the uh, retail demand uh, stays put during the year. Uh, but but from, from currently what we see, it seems to be okay. So can you give us a number on what the order book situation is right now and what is the expectation? And I think last time you said that you're looking at a 20% growth rate. Uh, by when do you think you could manage to eke that out? I, I think from a 25, uh, FY25 perspective, I think we will be working towards that. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm confident that, uh, you know, with all the initiatives that we've taken, we should be seeing pretty good growth in FY25 or FY24. Okay, all right. Uh, Mr. Ganapati, I don't want to ask you in the near term because you obviously will be in silent period, but you have capacities Correct. that are coming in stream. And I uh, recall that, you know, you were indicating that maybe you hit more or less the optimum utilization levels, optimum revenue levels by FY26. Give and take everything, how demand is shaping up. Do you think Gokuldas exports will be in that vicinity of closer to around 3,500 crores revenue by 2026? It should be. That's the that's the uh, aim. You know, three and a half would be uh, you know directionally where we think we will go. So so that's that's kind of yeah. You're you're on the ballpark. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Gramsci, just two questions. I mean, just to come back mm -hmm. to that, uh, the, the, you said you your business is uh, FOB, uh, but it, would would there be no negotiation asking you to share a portion of the burden as well? I mean, down no. the line, if this no. continues, no. No, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we will we will bear that, uh, you know, given given that uh, how costs have, uh, you know, functioned, etc. 
the freight is entirely on the customer scope and uh, you know we will not take take that uh, cost up on our books so okay. so I, we right. haven't seen that happen in the past and i don't foresee that happening in the future as well okay if, if at uh, all there will be a negotiation yeah. between the you know freight uh, you know the uh, freight companies or the logistics companies and the brands they will negotiate and you know they will try to see if the shipping companies can defray part of the cost or absorb it it'll be a negotiation between the two right oh. how, the, you know you uh, <clears throat> how's the uh, the big the big acquisition you announced a few months ago uh, coming along what's the what's That's the latest good. yeah so so we just concluded it in fact we got uh, the regulatory approvals uh, for uh, most of the uh, different uh, assets and uh, we've uh, taken control of the asset as of uh, mm. 3rd of january so so now now it's very much part of uh, gokulda's exports got it all right uh, we'll leave it at that uh, thank you for joining us and explaining the business as well as the red sea situation and uh, i mean saying that it has no impact on your business at the moment that's gokulda's exports but the next big trigger to watch is the earning season that's about to kick start in just a couple of days from now it's a special segment quarter se quarter tak reema is joining in to tell us what to expect from the it sector reema over to you thanks so much for that in terms of <coughs> sorry in terms of numbers q3 fi24 is likely to be another weak quarter for the indian it industry two reasons for that weak seasonality higher than usual for lows and then again the continuation of weakness in discretionary demand in fact according to a cnbc tv 18 poll four out of the large six it companies are likely to report a decline in their uh, top line all except hcl tech and lti mindtree where you will see a bit of a growth now if you look at the numbers the losses are estimated to be steepest for wipro at minus 2.4% dollar revenue down on a quarter on quarter basis for infi down 1.5 to 2% tcs will be on the flattish side it's hcl tech and lti mindtree which will buck the trend HCL tech growth seen the highest at close to about four percent, driven by a Verizon contract, a very large deal that they had earlier won, an acquisition of A A S A P, and seasonal strength in their products business. While LTI Mine Tree is also going to show the growth this quarter, and they had already guided that H two will be better than H one. Now, on the important subject of F I twenty four guidance, and it is possible that revenue downgrades continue. In fact, Kotak and Ambit expect enforcers to further cut the revenue growth guidance. It currently stands at one to two and a half percent. They're saying the upper end of the guidance could be brought down to one to two percent. GS and MS, that's Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, also see enforcers trimming or you know just uh, narrowing its guidance band to one and a half to two percent. Basically, the upper end of enforcers' guidance of two and a half percent comes down to two percent. If that happens, this will be the third guidance cut by Infosys this year. Even for HCL Tech, J.P. Morgan is saying that we expect the FI24 CC organic growth guidance to be cut by 50 basis points to about four to five percent for the services business and three and a half to four and a half percent for the overall business. Now, Wipro gives you a quarterly guidance. You're going to be watching out for the Jan to March quarter, and it's expected to be another muted guidance from them. The range is minus one to plus one percent. Now on FI24 margins the guidance by both Infi and HCL Tech is likely to be maintained according to most analysts. Now let's tell you what the street is focusing on. Well it's going to be commentary on demand revival. Investors want to see signs of year on year revenue growth bottoming out. Bottoming out. What will CY24 budgets look like? Are there any green shoots in laggard sectors like BFSI, telecom, high tech? Also this quarter has seen fewer large Of mega deal wins, which dominated the narrative in the first half of the year, so the deal win number, the TCV number, could look lower on a quarter-on-quarter basis. If you remember, this was also the quarter where Infosys had announced that a large 1.5 billion MOU, which was signed by the company with a global client, got terminated. Very unusual for a company like Infosys. And on Q3 margins, for most companies, it will either be flat or higher, barring Infi and Wipro, where margins are likely to decline. on account of wage hikes and finally on wipro there has been a lot of news flow on the hr front senior level exits continue legal suits reports of the promoter being unhappy with the ceo but you know despite all this stocks have done well from the last quarter to this quarter we're looking at a three month performance and it's been a double digit return for a company like hcl tech even wipro or even tech mahindra has actually clocked in a double digit return in the last three months so now on the subject of valuations no longer very cheap 
still not at the premium peak valuations, but it's a 27 times forward multiple for TCS, 23 times for Infosys, and for HCL Tech, Wipro, it's broadly in that band of 20 to 22 times. Now, you know, in a nutshell, if you have to summarize, the NSC IT index has recovered nearly 24% in the past 12 months, despite no visible pickup in demand. So stocks have run up in anticipation of a demand revival. And I think this quarter, what the street wants to see, if not in the numbers, but maybe in the commentary, we hear from them about a demand revival, which will justify the run up that we've seen in the stock prices. All right, uh, that's very, very comprehensive, Rima. Thanks very much for that uh, excellent preview of uh, what we should expect from the uh, infra from the uh, IT companies for the third quarter. Kavaljit Saluja is Executive Director and Head of Research at Kodak Institutional Equities, who's watched this space for a long, long time. Kavaljit, great, uh, great to have you with us here. Uh, and uh, Happy New Year from all of us here, to you, your team. <clears throat> so, uh, to your mind, uh, is, uh, you know, what, are the, what are the top two or three things uh, which which will be the most important uh, for investors who've been uh, holding stocks or have been wanting to buy into some of these large cap IT names. <clears throat> I guess uh, uh, the key thing which everyone will be focused on is uh, on uh, revenue acceleration in FY25 and whether there are any clear signs of visibility of that uh, acceleration. Uh, now, two things will give you that uh, visibility. One is, uh, 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 you know, uh, essentially your improvement in discretionary spending. Uh, let's say if uh, companies indicate that discretionary spending, uh, you know, budgets are closed, they are looking all right, then that will give confidence. Though knowing companies, uh, you know, typically in the month of Jan, they do not say a whole lot. And second would be uh, mega deals, large deals, or your TCB numbers, uh, which we expect uh, uh, to be fairly muted uh, uh, for this quarter. So I don't think that uh, uh, there'll be anything much uh, that will come out uh, from the quarterly numbers to give visibility on current year 24 or FI25, which is where people will pick up cues from macros uh, 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 rather than uh, you know, company-specific commentary. Uh, if you're looking for positives, then yeah, I mean, you know, December would be the worst quarter, so March would be better. At least uh, many of the companies would return to growth, yeah. Okay, so you're saying that compared to the previous quarter, this one is not going to be as bad. Maybe sequentially things uh, may improve, right? That's the that's the right way to that look at it. That will happen in March. That will happen in March 2020. In the March quarter. March quarter. That's right. Yeah. Okay, got so it. But, I mean, no one has any expectations from this December quarter either, right? They're all expecting either flat or slightly some amount of pressure, etc. But in the commentary, uh, just to take that point forward, is there any hope for a revival in 2024 that we can expect? There will be an improvement in, uh, 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 you know, the growth for FI25 will be better than FI24. And there are a couple of reasons why growth in FI25 will be better than FI24. Uh, first is that uh, companies will get between 2 to 4 percent of revenues uh, from mega deals. That's something which did not uh, exist or rather was not there at the beginning of FI24, but which would be there in the beginning of FI25. Second is that, you know, in FI24, there was unusually high number of program uh, cancellations and reprioritization. Uh, uh, you know, of uh, uh, programs, uh, uh, which, you know, the same intensity would not continue in FI25. So I guess, uh, you know, FI25 will be better than FI24. But the key question is that would FI25 uh, uh, you know, be strong enough uh, to meet where the current consensus estimates are, which is, let's say, for tier one companies, uh, you know, a growth rate in the vicinity of around uh, 9 to 10%? I don't think so. So an improving direction, I mean, improving trajectory, yet, you know, even with that improving trajectory, there will be revenue and EPS downgrades once this quarterly result season is uh, done. Okay. Hi, Kavaljit. Good morning. So maybe another quarter of pain is what we could see before moving on from here. Kavaljit, if you had to pick a couple of uh, companies, you know, which uh, could deliver a positive and a, and a negative surprise, you could name two or three companies, you know, from your note uh, this time around and a couple of factors that we should be looking at as well. Uh, Nigel, if you are putting out a preview, I guess that just encapsulates <laughs> our expectations. So I guess nothing much would change. But if you're looking at companies uh, uh, with, uh, you know, a reasonably good 
uh, uh, December quarter, it would be persistent. I think uh, they deliver a fabulous, uh, you know, growth. Uh, uh, you know, and then you will have mega deal ramp up led growth uh, for HCL Tech, which on a sequential basis will be fairly high at 4.3%. Uh, but on a YOY basis, given the product seasonality and the noise, the growth will still be at a moderate 0.8%. Uh, 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 you know, uh, so, but, you know, if you look at the pack as a whole, or let's say the large cap, the fact is that the growth rates have uh, slowed down. So I guess everything boils down to uh, you know, FI25, what I'm essentially saying is that you will not get enough cues from the management on uh, FI25, and you have to take a call based on macros. And our view is that business will improve uh, for sure, though not to the extent compared to where the consensus estimates are. Okay, and Mark, uh, consensus expectation already high, and uh, they probably they'll have to be brought lower even for FI25, as you're saying. Kavalji, just a quick word on Wipro, if you can. Uh, should we expect anything there? Uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Rima was talking about uh, maybe there have been reports of promoters, uh, you know, not very happy with uh, how how things have been running there. There have been uh, top management uh, some, uh, sort of exits, etc. as well. Uh, stock's been an underperformer. Is is there potential for uh, some, some some change? Should we uh, hear anything? I mean, you know, look, I think... Uh, even the way the company has performed, uh, you know, it's logical. Even the CEO would be uh, not very happy with the way, uh, let's say, uh, the company has, uh, you know, done. Well. I mean, you know, perform. But you know, beyond that, it's just speculation, and I don't want to get into, uh, uh, you know, those kind of uh, speculation as such. The fact is that the environment has been uh, challenging, and Wipro's uh, challenges have been amplified by the fact that they have a high exposure to discretionary. Uh, uh, spending or consulting, uh, you know, revenues, yeah. And let's say if uh, the discretionary spend uh, recovers, then of course, Wipro will also be a beneficiary of it, yeah. A disproportionate uh, beneficiary? If, uh, I mean, consulting is the is I think amongst the large cap IT names, Wipro has got the highest, right? Exposure. <coughs> so, yes. uh, in, as you say, you would... Okay. Okay, all right. Uh, got that. Uh, Gavajit, uh, good to have you with us. Uh, thank you very much for your time and I hope to speak with you once we have the numbers with us uh, for a quick uh, review. Appreciate it. Well, that's uh, <clears throat> Kavaljit with, uh, from Kotak with his perspective on IT uh, services and the third quarter numbers there. Markets up 120 points. Uh, Mitesh is with us uh, to run us through what he's making uh, of the market uh, right now. Mitesh. I, I love how you just said, you know, markets are up 120 points. I mean, <laughs> that's just par for the course. This 120 <laughs> points, Prashant, come on. <laughs> okay, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> it gets some more energy <laughs> into there. All right, no, I'm uh, just kidding. <clears throat> Mitesh, uh, how are things uh, looking? Uh, good for more or would you wait for the Nifty to cross yesterday's high uh, before taking a, a more constructive kind of view, before actually taking a trade, putting in a trade there? So, Prashant, uh, early in the day, the idea was that you will get a gap up, you'll get possibly a 40 50 point kind of dip, which happened. And I think that was the entry point. Uh, I still believe that this market is ranged and might see supply around 21,740, but logically 21,800, 820 is the target area. So, maybe you'll see some more upward push. If not today, maybe you know, uh, tomorrow day after. But I think it is still a market which is sideways broadly, and therefore buying near the low end of the range will always be rewarding. Uh, till that breaks and then you'll have a minor stop loss to protect your capital. Uh, on the stock side, I think, you know, LTTS uh, is on the list. That's a buy with a stop below 5200 for targets of 5500. And Britannia is something which is turning negative. So a sell here with a stop at about 5180 for targets of 5050. Uh, well, thanks a lot for that, Mitesh. Uh, one stock that is just not participating in the rally, in fact, it's under a lot of pressure right now, is Z. Um, the stock is down 9%. Now, there is a chance that the Z Sony merger may not go through because of all the latest developments. If you're not in on the developments, Hormuz is here uh, to give us the latest. Hormuz, over to you. You know, as you said, there are chances because there's still no certainty there as well. And it stems from a Bloomberg report which came out last evening, which said that Sony is planning to call off this proposed $10 billion merger. And it's planning to send the notice, uh, the termination notice on the 20th of January. Now, 
Now, this is the Bloomberg report citing sources. And the merger, as you know, has been in the works since 2021. So, there has been a lot of back and forth since then with no clarity emerging. And now, Sony is planning to pull the plug. Now, why is Sony planning to pull the plug is because they do not want Puneet Goenka to lead the merged entity because of a regulatory probe that is ongoing right now. And again, that is part of the report as well. And we need to uh, ensure that to, to tell our viewers that CNBC TV18 has not independently verified this story. Now, what has happened here is that in August of last year, both Subhash Chandra and Puneet Goenka were barred by SEBI from holding any key managerial positions in Z Entertainment. And this was amidst the fact that SEBI was planning to complete the probe in the next eight months. And But Puneet Goenka appealed against this order and the SAT, the Securities Appellate Tribunal, uh, overturned the SEBI ban on this and Puneet Goenka was reinstated as the MD and CEO of Z Entertainment on the 30th of October last year. But nonetheless, there is still uncertainty over this deal. The stock is under pressure. This is the biggest single day drop since April of 2021. But remember, the stock is in the FNO band today. And as a result of this drop, the stock's market cap has fallen below the 25,000 crore mark. Back to you. Okay, some attempts at a recovery, etc., all uh, sold into and down over 10%, as Homer's points out. Homer, thanks very much uh, for that. We'll take a quick commercial break here. We put the focus on commodities. Manisha is here uh, to help us do that in just a bit. <laughs> Welcome back. Let's get a quick handle on what's happening in the world of commodities. Manisha Gupta is joining in. Manisha, what's the one commodity that you're tracking this morning? Well, I'm looking at the crude oil prices. This is one area where you have seen very strong volatile moves coming in as we start a new year. So last week was 2% of gains, but overnight we've seen 4% of a decline come in for the crude oil prices. So after 10% of decline in 2023, 2024 has begun with a negative move already for the first in 9 or 10 days for the crude oil prices there. With the kind of decline that we are working with, we already trading are, we are already trading at around 6-month lows right now. Well, three or four factors which are putting pressure right now. One is the weak demand that we've seen come in from Asia, including China, and that has led to Saudi Arabia cutting their official price to Asia by one and a half to two dollars and this is the lowest that they've done in 27 months for the Asian consumers in sense of official prices there and then it also is about the rise in output uh, from OPEC we had, they have been talking about cuts but when you look at the month of December 70,000 barrels per day of an increase is what has been noted so December output stands at 27.88 million barrels per day the US drilling also has continued to rise well 501 as of now and a forecast of 20 additional rigs in 2024 continues to weigh onto the markets. Remember, U.S. has been producing record crude oil for the last four months now at around 13.2 million barrels. Within OPEC as well, it is higher output from Angola, Iraq, Nigeria. So most of these African countries will continue to produce more. They haven't agreed to a quota agreement from the OPEC there. If you look at the global consumption there, and we have seen a bit of a decline come in for that one. Uh, for the month of December, it was a sharp decline at 1.3 million barrels. Overall, for 2023, the 1.8 million barrels per day of a global consumption still stands on a taller side there. The Israel-Hamas war and uh, the Red Sea concerns, Syria output uh, halting, all of that has led to premium in prices. But you have to understand that it hasn't impacted the oil output in any way. And the concern clearly comes in from the demand side of it. Because when you look at the numbers from US, Europe and Asia, the demand has seen a decline in the previous quarter and that would continue to weigh onto the markets. It also has been about the high U.S. gas inventories. The display demand in U.S. is the lowest since 1999, and that doesn't help as well. Add to that the fact that the U.S. dollar index is trading on the higher side. The U.S. non-farm payroll data came in better. And the expectation now on the U.S. Fed rate cut for this current quarter really seems to be waning. It was at 90% by mid-December. It stands at below 60% at this point in time. What the street will watch out for is the EIA short-term outlook in sense of global demand and supply numbers. That is going to be important. And the next OPEC meeting now has been fixed for 1st of Feb. So that's another thing that the street will keep an eye on. Okay, thanks a lot, Manisha, for that. Let's slip into a quick break on that note. On the other side of the break, our special segment, Outlook 2024. Lata will get chatting with Jahangir Aziz of JP Morgan and Robert Sokin of City to discuss their outlook for 2024 and the key growth trends for India and the US. Stay tuned.